Adrian N. Breitfelder, City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call a regular session of the City Council to be held on Monday, November 21st, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting such business that may properly come before the City Council. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a regular session of the Dubuque City Council for November 21st, 2022. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input or virtual audio and written input during the sections of the agenda where public input is accepted. Input options during the live meeting include, in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any public input on the item they would like to speak to. Remote attendees can log in to GoToMeeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access code that appear on the broadcast and live stream and posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, indicate which item you would like to speak to in the chat function or note that you would like to speak during the appropriate section. If you are participating via phone, indicate which item you would like to speak to when phone lines are unmuted. All phone lines will be unmuted during the consent agenda, public hearings, and public input periods, and city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. All comments, whether in-person or virtual, must be accompanied by a name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the city council directly from the city's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the city clerk's office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will be reiterated during the meeting. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Cavanaugh? Here. Council members Farber? Here. Jones? Here. Resnick? Here. Roussel? Here. Sprank? Here. Wethel? Here. City Manager Van Milligan? Here. And City Attorney Brumwell? Here. Thank you. Mayor Cavanaugh, I will turn it over to you for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Adrian. I invite all who are able to please stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. We will move on now to consent items. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the consent items, please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there's any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Please state the item you would like removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration, and consent items can be found on pages two through three of the agenda. Thank you, Adrian. Do we have anyone here in chambers who would like to hold any of the consent items for separate discussion, please? Seeing no one, do we have anyone virtually? There are no virtual comments. Okay. And no input received. All right, back to the table then, please. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file the documents, adopt the resolutions, and deal with the consent items as recommended. Second by Farber. Got a motion by Resnick and a second by Farber. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Farber. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. We will move on to items set for public hearing, and we have one. Flora pool filter tanks and recirculation pump replacement initiate bidding process and set public hearing for December 5th, 2022. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file, adopt the resolution, and set the public hearing for December 5th. Second. And a motion by Roussel and a second by Jones. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Farber. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. We will move on to boards and commissions. We have appointments for the Community Development Advisory Commission, the Park and Recreation Advisory Commission, and the Resilient Community Advisory Commission. All right, thank you, Adrian. So our first is the Community Development Advisory Commission. We have one three-year term through February 15th, 2023, and one applicant, so I will entertain a motion, please. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Sprank. I would like to recommend that we appoint Gabriel Mozina to the year. Second. All right, we got a motion by Sprank and a second by Resnick. Um, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. 
Motion passes 7-0. Gabriel Mozina is appointed to one three-year term through February 15th, 2023 on the Community Development Advisory Commission. The next commission is a Park and Rec Advisory Commission. We actually have two terms here, so one three-year term through June 30th, 2023, and then one three-year term through June of 2025. So I think the easiest way to do this would be, as we usually do, we'll take the first term and we will go take a roll call around the entire desk and then um, if you could please name a person that you would want on the, for the first three-year term on June 30th, 2023. Sound good? All right. So this Adrian, is the shortened term. The shortened term, yes, thank you. So Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel. Josh Jorgensen. Jones. Ron Axtell. Farber. Ron Axel. Resnick. Ron Axtell. Kavanaugh. Ron Axtell. Roussel. Ron Axtell. Sprank. Ron Axtell. So Ron Axtell is appointed to one three-year term through June 30th, 2023. So move, moving on to the three-year term, I'm sorry, through the, yes, three-year term through 2025, uh, we'll do the same. So if Adrian, if you could call the roll, please. Wethel. Josh Jorgensen. Jones. Shirley Snow. Farber. Josh Jorgensen. Resnick. Shirley Snow. Kavanaugh. Josh Jorgensen. Roussel. Josh Jorgensen. Sprank. Josh Jorgensen. Josh Jorgensen is appointed to the other three-year term through 2025. So our final commission is the Resilient Community Advisory Commission. We have one cross-representative whose term is going to coincide with their term on their cross-represented board or commission. And we have three applicants, so we'll do the same. We'll take a roll call, please, and then um, we can name who we'd like for that one term. Wethel. <coughs> Stephen Drahosel. Jones. Steve Drahosel. Farber. Stephen Drahosel. Resnick. Stephen Drahosel. Kavanaugh. Stephen Drahosel. Roussel. Stephen Drahosel. Uh, Stephen Drahosel. So Stephen Drahosel is appointed to the cross-representative term on the Resilient Community Advisory Commission. We will move on to public <clears throat> hearings. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the public hearing items, please plan to approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Public hearing number one is Upper B Branch Creek Restoration Railroad Sanitary Interceptor Crossing Project, part of phase four of the B Branch Watershed Flood Mitigation Project. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resident. I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Farber. Got a motion by Resnick and a second by Farber. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. City Engineer Gus Sahoyas is recommending City Council adopt the resolution approving the proposed plans, specifications, form of contract, and construction estimate in the amount of $3,203,300 for the Upper B Branch Creek Restoration Railroad Sanitary Interceptor Crossing Project. The project consists of the construction of trenchless installation of one 48-inch diameter steel casing across the railroad property that will house a 36 inch diameter sanitary sewer, a reinforced concrete transition structure, restoration of Garfield Avenue, fiber optic lines, vegetative surface restoration, and other miscellaneous elements. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are in a public hearing to consider City Council adoption of a resolution approving the proposed plan, specifications, form of contract, and construction estimate in the amount of $3,203,300 for the Upper B Branch Creek Restoration Railroad Sanitary Interceptor Crossing Project. Do we have anyone from the public who would like to address us on this item? Anyone virtually? Not on this item. Okay. And no input received. All right, thank you. I'll bring it back to the table then for any discussion. Seeing none, uh, motion by Resnick, second by Farber. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. 
Motion passes 7 0. Public hearing number two is public hearing and approval of Plaza Drive Urban Revitalization Plan. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended. Second by Sprank. Motion by Jones and a second by Sprank. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Steger is recommending City Council approve the Plaza Drive Urban Revitalization Plan. The proposed urban revitalization plan will provide up to 10 years of tax abatement on new construction of multifamily housing units within the designated area. The development plan for the lot in the proposed district provides for the construction of 390 units of multi-residential market rate workforce housing. This will be constructed in 13 three-story buildings and will include community amenities such as a pool and dog park. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are on a public hearing to consider city council approve the Plaza Drive Urban Revitalization Plan and the city manager is recommending approval. Anyone from the public to address us on this particular item? Seeing no one here, anyone virtually? There's not. Okay. And no input received. All right, thank you. Back to the table then for any discussion. All right, seeing none, uh, we have a motion by Jones uh, and a second by Sprank to waive the three readings. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second by Sprank. A motion by Jones and a second by Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. We will now move to public input. <clears throat> At this time, anyone participating in the meeting may address the City Council on the action items on the agenda or on matters under the control of the City Council. For all in-person attendees, please approach the podium and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there's any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Individual remarks are limited to five minutes and the overall public input period is limited to 30 minutes. Under the Iowa Open Meetings Law, the City Council can take no formal action on comments given during public input or that do not relate to the action items on the agenda. All right, thank you, Adrian. So I see quite a crowd tonight, and I'm guessing you're not here just to watch the show. So I wanted to say a few things before we actually get started. Um, we, first of all, we've, we've received a ton of public input over the last few days, and thank you. We really appreciate that. That's very, very helpful as we have tough decisions to make up here. Um, what I found is that we live in a city that is absolutely filled with passionate people who really want to all the best for their town. And I think that that's one of the things that makes me most proud to be a Dubuque. Um, and I see that in all the things that we were, that we were receiving here in the last couple of days. So uh, while I'm certain we're gonna hear from quite a few of you tonight, um, and we sincerely appreciate it, we're gonna be glad for the time. Um, I, I wanna let you know that I believe strongly in our ability to speak freely when we're in a place like this, when we need to address our government in some way. So I encourage everybody to do that. Um, I think that there's going to be quite a few of you, so if, there, if that is the case, I'm willing to be able to go longer than 30 minutes uh, within reason, so um, you know, just to make sure that everybody gets a chance to be able to say what they need to say. I would ask that you please try and keep your comments to five minutes, just out of respect for everybody who's here. I think that's an important thing that we can try to do. And then also, while free speech is essential, and I think it's very important, I think we need to do it within the bounds of civility. So what I would ask is that as you make your argument, you stick to your argument. You have some good ones. There are some, there's some really good points that I think I've come across in reading all the comments that we've had so far. And I'm looking forward to hearing what people have to say tonight. But what I'd like you to try to do is stick to the argument and avoid any sort of personal attacks. Don't meander in that direction. If that does happen, I'm going to stop you. And I want you to know that. So as you, as you present your argument, I would hope that you do so in a way that is respectful to everyone who's sitting here at this desk, but then also everyone who's in the community here or listening or otherwise. So with that said, um, 
I want to just, a couple things. So if there's more than one person that's ready to speak, feel free to, to stand up and, and line up over along that wall over there. We don't need like 10 people lined up, but I mean, you can, you can get in line and get ready to go. When you come up, uh, make sure you say your name and your address, just for the record. The, speak into the mic so everybody at home can hear you. And then there's a little, um, is it on the right side? Yes. Of the podium, yeah. On the right side of the podium, there's a little switch. You can move the desk up and down. So if you can't see us over the computer, we probably can't see you. So go ahead and lower it so we can see you a little bit. All right? So with that said, we'd love to hear any, from anyone who has anything to say tonight. Hello, uh, my name is Dwayne Haggerty. I'm president and CEO of Heritage Works. We're at 489 uh, West 4th Street. I also own my home at 1100 Main Street. And um, I'm here to talk about the, um, the amendment to the, the proposed amendment to the conservation district. And I'm gonna keep my comments brief because I have sent all of you letters and, and um, you know, the, thing, the things that I wanna stress are that, you know, Heritage Works we pride ourselves on partnerships and collaboration with people in this community to redevelop our beautiful historic buildings in downtown and throughout Dubuque. And you know, oftentimes I think historic preservation is viewed as being obstructionist or um, as being you know, rigid. And um, Heritage Works really prides itself on what we call historic activation. It's bringing life back to these buildings. And so wherever we see an opportunity to redevelop a historic building, we will take that, we will advocate for it. So that was what we saw when, uh, when we saw that the uh, Knights of Columbus building was the potential for, for being torn down. Um, you know, we, we had been talking with Cottingham and Butler about it, um, even before they applied for their demolition permit with, with the commission, uh, Historic Preservation Commission. And, you know, the thing that we wanted to make sure everyone was aware of is that, you know, this building, though it has, you know, some, it had been bricks filled in the windows and, and it just looked like a building that currently was lifeless, that this building could be brought back to life. So we wanted to help um, the, we wanted to take an opportunity to help uh, uh, rehab that building. So we did engage with Cottingham and Butler. We, um, we, Jeff Morton, who's done a lot of redevelopment or um, restoration projects in Dubuque, helped out Gronin was involved. Emily Sewell from Gronin was also involved. So we thought we had a productive conversation, a productive collaboration with Cottingham and Butler. And so it did come as a surprise to me when um, the agenda for the um, agenda item was placed uh, to uh, remove the the whole block from the conservation district. Um, we wanted to continue the, the conversation and the collaboration um, because, you know, we at Heritage Works, you know, we do value development. We value um, the fostering of a strong business community in downtown Dubuque. Um, just in the, in the seven years that we've been in existence, we have helped with partners to redevelop over $60 million worth of property in downtown Dubuque. Um, we are currently working on additional projects that will invest almost another $60 million in downtown Dubuque. Um, through those projects, over 750,000 square feet will be reactivated in downtown Dubuque. Over 113 affordable housing units will be either rehabbed or created new. So we, we're, we want to be a problem solver. We want to catalyze development. We don't want to block it. So that's why we always work to um, to bring solutions to the community. So I would like to see more kind of preemptive conversation and discussions about, especially in a, in a case where you're removing an entire block from a conservation district. Conservation districts, our historic districts, are the strongest tools that we have in a community to save and keep our historic buildings, to activate those, those buildings for new use. And when you're taking one entire block out of the conservation district, that's a pretty drastic step. So it would have been nice to have some prior conversation about it, maybe even have a community engagement session where we could have come, the Dubuque Museum of Art could have come to talk about their future plans. I would love to hear about their future plans. I love the art museum. I love that organization. Cottingham and Butler, great um, business in, in Dubuque. It's, one of the reasons why our downtown is as vibrant as it is, I would love to hear about their plans for, uh, for childcare. And you know, even 
with a new building, would love to see what that building will look like to make sure that it fits within the character of downtown Dubuque. So again, you know, discussions, collaboration, these, this is how we have been successful in Dubuque over the years. I'm relatively new to Dubuque, but you know, everything, a lot of the things that really has brought a renaissance to downtown Dubuque happened before I came here, but we have had some great progress since I've been here. I wanna continue that progress. I wanna to continue to partner with the city. I wanna to continue to partner with these wonderful businesses in downtown Dubuque. So I just hope you take that into consideration as to what the impact will be on our conservation districts and our historic districts. Does this set a precedent? Does this create a tool for some bad actors to wanna to come and destroy some of our beautiful historic districts? Um, the other thing that needs to be kept in mind is what impact does this, what, what message does this send to our historic preservation commissions that work so hard, that volunteer their time, that bring, bring the expertise in this area to the city council and to the city. So thank you. Thank you, Dwayne. Appreciate it. Good evening, uh, David Becker. Uh, I work with Cottingham and Butler, 800 Main Street, and a residence in town at 1767 Dover Court. Um, I'm also speaking about the uh, the block being removed from the district. So, um, first of all, I don't envy you folks. This is a tough decision. Um, I would say, on the surface. It appears that tonight's conversation is about the historic significance of the Knights of Columbus building and what to do about that. And the desire and passion of Duane and his organization is um, not lost on us. Um, matter of fact, I don't know if there's any organization that more respects and admires their position. Um, Cottingham and Butler has been a huge champion for development and we've backed up that belief by investing tens of millions of dollars in the security building, the town clock building, and the Roshek building over the years that we've been in town. But I think if you look at it, Cottingham and Butler's historic significance goes well beyond our investment in buildings. We've been here 130 years in Dubuque, and by far and away, our biggest investment has been and continues to be in the people that work for Cottingham and Butler in Dubuque. We employ over 1,200 people, about 800 of which are in Dubuque. We've added nearly 100 of those Dubuque jobs in the past 18 months. To add that many people to an organization in a town the size of Dubuque, you really need more than just being a great company to work for. You need to be located in a great community where people want to live. Part of our responsibility as corporate citizens is to invest in our community so we can ensure that people can build a great life outside of work. And I think we've done that. We've invested in the many fine amenities in our town, the symphony, the art museum, the grand theater. We've given time and money to support our educational institutions, both at the grade school, the high school, and the college level. We've been leading supporters of greater Dubuque development. And our people sit on countless numbers of boards trying to make Dubuque a better place to live. But every community faces real challenges and hurdles. And according to our employees, and candidly many others in the area, childcare is one of those big hurdles. There are very few options. People complain about waiting lists that can be for more than six to 12 months long. High cost, and for us, I think we have something like 50 pregnancies going on right now. General panic about what are we gonna do once we have our children. We started looking into how to provide a safe, convenient, and quality daycare option in downtown Dubuque, near where all of our people work. We identified the Knights of Columbus site as an opportunity, talked to the Knights of Columbus about our ideas, and they actually were very much in support of trying to do this. Consistent with the standard that John Butler has always done, we have set a developed a vision of building a daycare facility that is of, of exceptional quality and exceptional beauty. We partnered with a number of experts, construction, architecture, and people who built childcare facilities all over the country. And we reached the conclusion that given the state of the building, a renovation really isn't compatible with the vision we have for building an incredible first-class daycare. We know this would be a lot easier conversation if it was, 
But that's not what happened, and now you all are faced with a really challenging decision. As I said, it would appear to be a decision about the historic significance of the building, but I was talking to some of our team today, and it kind of crystallized for me that I think this is really about a different issue. This is about a decision about making a significant difference to our community and the people who work and live here. We have a chance to knock down a hurdle for our people and to make the community a better place to live. Do we have a responsibility to preserve the past? Absolutely. But not at any cost, and especially not at the cost of people having the support and services they need to successfully raise a family here in Dubuque. Now, understand that this isn't an issue that the CEO of a business like Connie Hammond Butler would normally get that excited about. I know in the note I sent to you folks, um, you know, 98% of our clients are from far away, and candidly, we could simply shift the mix of where our employees live and work without probably a horrible amount of trouble. But my curse is that this business is owned by John Butler and his family. And when I met John, what he said to me was, I am so committed to Dubuque. I expect the headquarters to be here forever. And if you have any ideas about changing that, don't come. Because I believe in this community. He is obsessed with making Dubuque a better place for our employees to call home and then putting his money and energy behind trying to make it so. I believe that if we're given the opportunity, we'll create something truly special, a historically significant investment in the one thing that has truly mattered in our company's history, an investment in our people and the people of Dubuque. I appreciate your time and consideration. Thank you, David. Hey all, I'm uh, Bill Doyle, live at 1591 White Street here downtown. Uh, I work, serve on the Historic Preservation Commission and work at Heritage Works. Uh, so I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about myself. I have seen most of you before, so I'm back. All right, uh, I came to Dubuque almost five years ago from Denver, Colorado. Uh, I love Denver a lot and I wasn't willing to move just anywhere. Um, this is one of many towns that kind of caught my attention when I was looking for work and uh, I was immediately struck by how cool it was. I came here in uh, January, I think, it was freezing out, but I was still ooing and eyeing it. Um, the wonderful built environment here. Uh, I became aware uh, shortly after moving here, a little bit before, I guess, that this city and the greater region continually loses its best and brightest to what you all call brain drain. Um, perhaps you have family members uh, who have moved to hip urban places like Denver, Colorado, Ash Asheville, North Carolina, Madison, Wisconsin. I know why people like those places. I'm from one of them. A big part of their appeal is in urban fabric, culture, and historic buildings. People like it so much that they spend $700,000 to, to move there. Yet I've met several other people in Dubuque who have moved here, just as I have done. Uh, people move to the downtown and see many of the same advantages they see in living in those hip neighborhoods in Madison, Wisconsin, or Denver. You've got beautiful old buildings, nice neighborhood coffee shops, nice walkable town. Uh, it's really a special place here. Um, people see the reuse of these old buildings as a sign of success, and they see their removal, I think, as a sign of failure. Popular cities are built on these old buildings because they provide an authenticity to the place where people live, and they provide a grounding effect. I think the merits of our historic fabric in Dubuque and the Knights of Columbus building were acknowledged when the city put it, the conservation district in the downtown and included the building in it. Demolition of the building was denied by the Historic Preservation Commission, as you all know. And they did the best they could with the information provided them, and I think they made a quite, quite reasonable decision to deny it. Um, I think the applicant had the, op op had the option to appeal the decision or to prove economic feasibility, and I think it's telling that they haven't tried to do that. Each individual commissioner on the HPC was appointed by city council, by, by you guys, and the mayor, based on our expertise. I personally have a background equivalent to the person who surveyed this building 20 years ago. My fellow commissioners include highly credible architects, real estate professionals, and people who have done preservation projects with their own two hands. I think there's a weirdly negative perception of historic preservation in this town, which supposedly prides itself on historic preservation. 
The Historic Preservation Commission is not a pearl clutching group of people who panics when their neighbor paints their fence pink or gets an ugly doghouse or something like that. Nor are we lowly do-gooders who don't understand the economics and real issues at play here. I assure you that we understand them perfectly well. I've seen the Main Street preservation urbanist development play out in real time, and I'm telling you it works. The Knights of Columbus Hall housed a foundational social organization for 100 years. I imagine most of them, these people in this room have, an attended a, have attended an event there, and I imagine a lot of you also had family who were uh, Knights of Columbus. Um, so I think those buildings and those institutions kind of house memories on which uh, community builds its identity. And while I understand that we can't build the future on these sentimental memories, I kind of find the notion that these memories are irrelevant to be shameful. Preserving this functional building honors the legacy of that organization and the legacy of our shared past. The children of our community could be cared for in the home of their ancestors, the kind of home base of their ancestors. I think that's a beautiful and grounding notion in the, in the increased context of in increasingly fractured social and geographic world that we now inhabit. The Knights of Columbus building is a gem in the rough. Uh, you guys should see the old photos. It's incredible. And the city's done incredible work with uh, gems in the rough. The whole Millwork district is probably, you know, should be nationally recognized for how incredible that building is. I went to Asheville, North Carolina, and they have this little industrial area that has, you know, incredibly hip, and it's, it's a quarter of what the Millwork district is. And we have gems like this that people don't even realize are gems because we have so many of them, and you've all been here for so long. Um, once that building is restored, it would be a really good spot for a childcare facility. I honestly believe that. Um, there have these beautiful windows that if you put them back in place would wash the whole place with natural light. Um, I think it's a really great opportunity. And I do think that this idea that we could have historic buildings or a childcare facility is a false dichotomy. That's mostly what I want to say. Thanks, guys. Thank you. We appreciate it. <clears throat> Hi there, Emma Stapleton, uh, 263 Hill Street. I am here on behalf of the Dubuque Museum of Art. Um, first, let me express my uh, gratitude for the City Council for your leadership and thoughtful consideration of this task at hand. Um, as many of you know, uh, the museum acquired the KDTH and AT&T buildings in 2016. And from the beginning, this was geared toward an eye of expansion. The removal of these buildings from the Conservation District allows us to continue moving forward toward meeting these expectations and goals. We look forward to working closely with the city and stakeholders to achieve that shared vision for the museum of the future. We at Duma are also enthusiastic about the potential for a childcare facility as our neighbor. Uh, the idea of the museum acting as a classroom, playground, and gathering place for young people and families is a wonderful opportunity that sets Dubuque apart as a vibrant community. Finally, as included in our letter submitted to the council, the museum would welcome the chance to display, preserve, interpret, and share the stories of any architectural elements of 781 Locus that are deemed to be of historic value. In doing so, we would ensure that the work of designers, architects, and artisans that came before us would be shared proudly with future generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Any others? I know this room, and it's not a shy room. <laughs> I appreciated the comment about the button that lowered it because I think it, last time it's I really see helpful, it. isn't it? It yeah. is very much. Um, good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council Molly Grover, Dubuque Area Chamber of Commerce, 300 Main Street. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak with you this evening. Um, thank you for your service and leadership to our, your community. As others have stated, um, this is not an easy decision, and I know one that you do not take lightly. And so we appreciate the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, the Chamber is here tonight to support the recommendation for the amendment to the Conservation dis District to remove the block. It is a fact that Iowa's population the, is the only state in the nation that has not doubled in population since 1900. 
It used to be that businesses could go wherever they wanted to go and the people would follow. Today that paradigm has shifted and now businesses go where the people go. We do have a population problem. We do have a workforce challenge. In fact, the Chamber Board of Directors approved their 2023 legislative agenda last week with one of the highlights being workforce development. At the top of that list is the challenges, the barriers to workforce development, and the child care issue being front and center. If we don't have opportunities for our workforce to have access to child care, they won't work here, they won't re-enter the labor force here, they won't move here, they won't live here. If we lose businesses, we lose jobs, we lose economic prosperity, and everything that we talk about and that we hold dear, everything that matters to us, everything that we're passionate about, we can talk all day long about all our priorities and all our goals. If we don't have people here in our community, nothing, none of the other things that we talk about matter. We have to have people in our community. We have to have businesses. We have to have jobs. We have to make it an attractive place to live, work, play, and do business. And that starts with making sure that we have a talented, growing workforce and population to support the needs of our business community. We appreciate your consideration. Um, I think no one can argue that there's few names that are more synonymous with historic redevelopment than Cottingham and Butler in our community. You look out any window in downtown Dubuque and you see that. Historic redevelopment is also important to the chamber, but we also have to be smart. And we also have to look at exceptions to the rule. And we also have to make sure that we are putting the greater good and the common good of all Dubuquers front and center, both now and in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Molly. <laughs> Hello, all. Emily Sewell, uh, 14247 North Cascade Road. Um, tonight I uh, will address you as a citizen, um, mainly because I uh, have a un unique position in this conversation. I am an architect. I specialize in historic preservation and adaptive reuse. I also served on the Historic Preservation Commission as a member and as a chairperson. Uh, and I'm also a mother of a one-year-old little boy that goes to a nonprofit daycare and I serve as a board member uh, for that nonprofit daycare. So, I have the experience of a lot of different fronts. And what, what I want to really get across from, from this conversation is that childcare really is a significant issue. And I won't go into a lot of the detail behind it, but in the past six, mo six months, I've been a part of conversations and meetings that uh, you know ended in tears of all of our board members, me coming to work with puffy eyes from the struggles of the workforce and being able to have a, a, to the talent and the teachers that we have luckily been able to secure, but with a significant pay increase in or a, a charge in our uh, in our student cost for being able to attend, and so those conversations are significantly significantly challenging for all of us on boards, and and I know that workforce is a big thing, and I would like to thank. GDDC and the Chamber and NICC for all of their efforts in increasing our childcare workforce. And that's something that I really want to get across that space if for childcare isn't necessarily the biggest issue. It's being able to staff it. It's being able to have those, those children be cared for by loving, talented professionals. And we have so many of them, but we don't have enough. And that's the real challenge. And speaking from the other side of it, I, our child care center is in, a, in, in the basement of a church off of an alley behind a, a laundromat. So trust me when I say it's not the ideal location, but I am so happy to drop him off every day because he is so excited to see the wonderful people that he spends his entire day with every single day. And so a modern child care facility with natural light and in a historic building and in the downtown core would be ideal. And there are so many different ways that that can be accomplished. And I would like everyone to please imagine with me the vision that could be, that could bridge this gap, because really that gap is not a gap at all. It's an opportunity. And all of these challenges and what I've learned from planning and design and personal and professional difficulties in all of these projects a challenge is just an opportunity to see something from a different perspective and to try to bridge that gap. 
So I would please recommend that we do not remove this from the conservation district, that we all bridge this gap together and we find a solution that is able to really bring together all of these challenges and we look beyond these challenges to the broader conversation and we are able to serve our community in every way, not just one. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, we're gonna stick with the comments in the chamber for right now. If anybody's virtual, if you would please mute. We hear some feedback in here, and then we'll come to you after we're done hearing from everybody who's here physically, please. Trying to hide my face. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mayor, ladies and gentlemen of the council, uh, City Manager Mike Van Milligan, most excellent city staff. My name is Rick Dickinson. I have pleasure of serving as the president of Greater Dubuque Development Corporation. Um, and I reside at 205 Hill Street uh, here in Dubuque. You can be great here. That's the theme of Greater Dubuque Development Corporation. I hope that's the theme of our community. It's a message that tells folks whether they've lived in Dubuque all their lives, or if they've set foot in Dubuque for the first time, or wherever they live across the nation, across the world, if they come to this place called Dubuque, they can be great here. It's about people, and that's what economic development is about in the 21st century. It's about having the people you need, especially in the Midwest, especially in Iowa, and here in Dubuque as well. And nearly eight months ago, the Board of Directors of Greater Dubuque Development authorized a study by Levi Studies to evaluate childcare in our community, understanding that childcare was one of the necessary components if we are to be a community of choice. You can see that study on greaterdubuque.org. The cover looks like this. And the question asked of business was, uh, are you concerned about childcare? 100% of the businesses responded that they were interested in learning more about childcare. 93% of the businesses said they were interested in partnering with childcare services. And one company, among others, but especially so, Cottingham and Butler, decided to do something about that. On August 18th, over, over three months ago, they requested the Historic Preservation Commission permission to remove the Knights of Columbus building from the Conservation District with the intent of raising it, I believe salvaging the materials, uh, not going to the landfill with it, doing the right thing in con consolation with Heritage Works. And they were turned down by the Historic Preservation Commission by a vote of seven to nothing, no. I think Dubuquers would be surprised to learn the instructions given to the uh, Historic Preservation Commission that night. Hap Olson did a great job of reviewing that. She reviewed the commission's role, that they are to use the information provided to make a determination of whether the structure has architectural or historic significance and review only the demolition request. The commission shall not, let me repeat, the commission shall not consider what is to be built or any other criteria or issues. Cannot consider what's next, what's in the best interest of this great community. I've shared this often. Time changes nothing. People with courage and initiative change things. People like you, people like John Butler, Andy Butler, David Becker. Time changes nothing by itself, but time can be weaponized through the power of delay. Delay will kneecap any initiative, no matter how courageous the actors. There is a legal maxim, justice delayed is justice denied. It means that if legal redress to an injured party is available, but is not forthcoming in a timely fashion, 
it is effectively the same as having no remedy at all. So too, with C and B, Cottingham and Butler's request, its correctness is self-evident, but delayed will be an opportunity lost. We must not delay further. Three months plus is already too long. We must find a path to yes. I did submit a, a letter to the mayor and council, and I think for the citizen's sake and our guests here this evening, I should repeat that letter. So if you forgive me, council, I'd like to read that to everyone concerned. Dear Mayor Cavanaugh and city council members, please accept this letter of full and unconditional support of the city manager's recommendation for approval of an ordinance to remove the area bounded by 7th Street, 8th Street, Bluff Street, and Locust Street from the conservation district. Mr. Van Milligan's memo to the council is spot on regarding the need and justification for this requested action. Unfortunately, in a letter to the mayor and council from Heritage Works, there appears to be an unintentional misrepresentation of both the role and responsibility of the mayor and the council in this matter. First, it suggests that a request to council for alteration is somehow a circumvention of existing city ordinance. Incorrect. My understanding is that the existing ordinance specifically anticipates direct requests to council. In fact, section 16108B provides that any person may request city council action as it relates to a conservation district. Second, they suggested that existing city process requires council action to be delayed. Again, that is incorrect. Section 6108B1 sets out the expectation that the council will act on any such request at its next regularly scheduled meeting after receiving it. Third, they suggest that council action will somehow short circuit what is described as a positive process of Heritage Works collaborating with Cottingham and Butler. Also, incorrect. Council action will not in any way impede the ability of these two companies to continue the productive conversation that Heritage Works informs the council is occurring. Fourth, it is interesting, it is being represented that direct council action would somehow disregard the hard work and the dedication of the members of the Historic Preservation Commission. We've already heard that this evening. Past history has shown that the council has supported the important work of the commission, but it has also shown that citizens have the ability to make requests or appeals directly to the elected representatives. A city council that considers information and exercises its independent judgment on what is in the best interests of its constituents is not, regarding the, is not disregarding the hard work of its staff or appointees. It is, in fact, doing the job they were elected to do. The building located at 781 Locust Street has a history. It is not historic. The block on which it is located has great potential, but to have that potential lost by delay would be a disservice to the greater good of our community, period. We must deliver on our statement you can be great here. Greater Dubuque Development asks for the mayor and council's favorable consideration and approval of the city manager's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. <clears throat> Any others here in chambers who would like to speak? Hello, Mayor and City Council. Uh, my name is Adam Schoeniger. I'm from 570 West 11th. I've moved um, <laughs> because I'm traditionally from Bennett Street. Um, when I first heard about this, I was actually surprised because, again, when you hear about Cottingham and Butler, you think, oh, they're going to preserve everything, you know, because we've unfortunately kind of come to expect that. Um, because you know, we don't have as many people doing that as, as what I believe they should. But um, I'm going to try to keep on track here. 
So basically, I do not believe that this building should be removed from the um, conservation district. Um, or actually the block, I should say. Um, I feel that if that were to happen, that just kind of opens it up to that happening elsewhere. Um, not to say that it will, but I just feel like once something's happened once, it's like you ask for an inch, you get a mile kind of thing. Um, I live in a historic district now, and I'm very thankful for that because I feel that anything I do to invest into my home will be that way because it is in the district where it is. And so anything that is done in a conservation district, and if, if it's removed from that, it's no longer protected. So it kind of loses its idea of being protected. Um, the other thing is, is everybody gets excited about something new and shiny and, and a, a daycare sounds great and everything. And I'm very much for adaptive reuse. So if something can be done where a daycare can be used in the Knights of Columbus building or perhaps a building nearby, um, I feel that would be more uh, sustainable. Um, I kind of think the thing that's in the back of my mind is I wasn't even alive around the time of urban renewal in Dubuque. Um, but there's a lot of times that I've gone through the old Dubuque books and I've seen photos of what there used to be downtown and I see pictures of that block and it's remarkable to see that that's, the Knights of Columbus building is the only thing left standing there. And I think that's kind of a testament um, to how strong it is and you know, how long it's had a useful life. And I think it can still be useful. Um, because I know there's one image that's stuck in my mind um, from I believe it's probably the late 60s, early 70s of the block where Five Flags sits right now. And it went from all these different architectural style buildings, Italianate and everything, of individual storefronts that were all removed. And we were luckily left with the theater. But now we have this bright, shiny new event center because it was something we needed and we had to hurry and get, get it built. But now here we are, 40 plus years later, wondering what we're going to do with it to keep it useful. And I'm not here to say that a daycare wouldn't be viable 40 years from now, but whatever replaces this building that's already been in place for 100 plus years, I would like to see it be something that would have a longer life than what we're used to as far as things that replace our historic buildings. So I'm sure I could add more to it, but I'll keep it brief. So thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. Appreciate it. All right, so before I go to the virtual, con oh, come on up, yeah. I'll just mention too, you know, just, just to make sure that it's clear for everybody. So once we're done with public input, we move on to action items. And once the action items are there, the public comment is, we, we no longer invite public comment. We, we make some exceptions here and there if there's a specific question from the council table, but otherwise it would be, this is really your opportunity to speak. So we appreciate you taking this time to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the city council, city manager, Mike Van Milligan. Uh, my name is Dave Clovitter. I live at 1090 West 3rd Street in Dubuque, uh, Dubuque's Langworthy Historic District. I volunteered for more than a decade on the city's Historic Preservation Commission. I'm a founding board member and current chairperson of Heritage Works. I do want to recognize Cottingham and Butler and, and John and Andy and Dave for all their work in uh, their record of historic preservation in the city. And I can now boast, too, that I am an employee of a Dubuque company which recently revitalized and activated a tired old building and created a gleaming and inspiring place to build a career. And congratulations on building Dubuque's population, 50 pregnancies, uh, that's a tough one to beat. <laughs> I like that. So my wife Kara and I have three school age kids. We know the value of childcare. My family loves the Dubuque Museum of Art. Uh, Kara and I have been hosts for its annual holiday party. We've lent artwork for their shows. I'm an ally, I am a fan, and I believe in what you want to achieve. In fact, others like me are more than willing, in good faith, to roll up our sleeves and get to work as part of the team. Um, but in this case, delay has been honest engagement by Heritage Works, which has been um, at the table uh, since the beginning, 
And tonight is a great and robust discussion. Um, I would have, would have been nice to know earlier than Friday, so I wouldn't have had to miss my choir rehearsal, but um, that's, what it, that's what it is. You know, Dubuque's cultural uh, asset is its architecture. It's shared by all of our citizens. It's why we have preservation ordinances, guidelines, and commissions. It's so the community has a voice in protecting that which affects us all. Historic architecture is like our, our own gold mine in Dubuque. It's a treasure to be uh, protected. Historic preservation ordinances are an essential tool in preserving historic character and value. These ordinances can be fragile and vulnerable to legal challenge if not carefully protected. Please think very hard about using such a blunt tool to extract an entire block from our conservation district. It may have unintended consequences. What's more, the dedicated citizens who serve on historic preservation commissions are our experts in the community, okay? They're volunteer citizens. <laughs> they need to feel that their work and, education and their educated opinion are valued and respected. Why do we have such a large number of vacancies on our commissions? Our community priorities are not mutually exclusive. Let's change our conversation to consider childcare and arts and culture and historic preservation. These conversations should be transparent and in good faith. So let's talk sooner, let's dream bigger, let's embrace diversity of thought. Come on, Dubuque. Together we can move faster, create opportunity, be inspirational. Come on, Dubuque. Thank you, Dave. Hello, RRS Stewart, 460 Summit Street. I'm here with a few hats on. I'm chair of Dubuque County Historic Preservation Commission. I'm the historian at St. Luke's United Methodist Church and of course also a resident of the city of Dubuque and a historian myself. Um, members of the City Historic Preservation Commission reached out to the County Historic Preservation Commission um, just to be clear, the county commission doesn't have anything to do with city conservation districts, so I'm not gonna speak about whether the building should ultimately be adapted or torn down. But as a county commission, we're a little disturbed to see the city commission uh, being disregarded a little bit. Um, because again, there is a process. Uh, the city commission made its decision three months ago. That was plenty of time to appeal its decision or file a certificate of non-viability. And rather than doing that, the company waited three months and then asked the city council to remove a block from the conservation district. Granted, any citizen could do that, um, but there were other steps they could have done in the intervening three months rather than doing that. Um, to switch to my historian hat, um, I do fill out the kind of building evaluations that were included that was sent to all of you along with the letter from City Council Member Van Milligan. And I feel like that building evaluation was misrepresented a little bit in the memo that was sent to you. Uh, the building does not have no historic value. Um, that's not what Jim Jacobson concluded. I actually talked to Jim Jacobson quite a bit because as a historian with the Technical Advisors Network, I fill out building evaluations all the time. People hire me to have their buildings evaluated to see whether they could be included or qualify for grants or tax credits. Um, and so the building actually does have some historic value. Again, that doesn't mean it ultimately couldn't still be torn down if it meets a certificate of non-viability. Um, and that would be the appropriate next step rather than to asking to have the whole block taken out of the conservation district. Um, and the final thing I'd just like to mention as we're talking about whether to take the whole block out of the conservation district or not, is that right now we're doing a survey of black heritage in Dubuque. And this block is actually very important to black heritage. So as I mentioned, I'm the historian at St. Luke's, which was founded in Washington Park. Our second location was actually where the Dubuque Museum of Art now stands. That's where the Centenary Church was. And when St. Luke's moved down to Main Street, the Centenary Church became the African Methodist Episcopal Church and the location of the black school in Dubuque. Now I know that building not's not there anymore because that's where the Dubuque Museum of Art is, but part of being a historian is recognizing community history and the location and history that blocks have and locations have. And so when we're talking about whether to 
to remove this block from the conservation district. I think part of the conversation as we move forward should be recognizing what was there before. And even if you ultimately decide to remove the block, maybe just encouraging the buildings that are there, whether it's the Museum of Art with their complex, trying to recognize the important history that was there that's there no longer, and how they're going to recognize that no matter what the ultimate decision is. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, RS. All right, any others? All right, I'll, we'll go to virtual comments then. Do we have folks that would like to speak in? We do. Terry Mozina would like to speak. All right, Terry, you have the floor. Uh, good evening. Terry Mozina, 1036 West 3rd Street. I'm sorry I'm not with you in person, but I got a little bit of a cold, and I certainly didn't want to pass that on to you fine folks. Um, I'd like to speak tonight a little bit more, <clears throat> excuse me, about the process of what's happening here. There's not a question about the integrity of the, the Butler family. There's not a question about the importance of daycare. Those can be removed from the equation because that's not the topic here. The topic is whether we're going to allow the demolition of an historic structure to accommodate something that could take place in a different location. And did we really explore all the, the options available before we're coming to this conclusion? One of the concerns I have is about actual, the action item itself this evening. There was no formal application made to alter the conservation district by Cottingham and Butler or the Dubuque, uh, Museum of Art. The only application that was put in, and that only occurred after I inquired for a copy of an application, was done by Mr. Van Milligan and not not either one of those two entities that that he alludes to that are going to benefit from the the removal of this block that concerns me if those two entities wanted it done why didn't they fill out the application the other thing i have concerned about is the historic preservation commission did their job several months ago and denied the demolition request unanimously and during that meeting it was suggested and asked that Cottingham and Butler look at other options, including partnering with NICC and the green space that's to the south of their buildings on Main Street. From my understanding, speaking with NICC, that conversation never took place. And I find that interesting considering that they have an early childhood development courses that could tie in perfectly. It's exactly 200, excuse me, exactly 360 feet from the door of the Roshek building to this green space where a new building could be built without the demolition of an historic structure and utilizing and also bringing in daycare opportunities for adult education to the NICC campus. That never took place. The other option that was talked about was looking at the green space down in the Port of Dubuque. That space is 2,000 feet, less than a quarter of a mile from the front door of the Roshek building. There are ample square footage down there of green space where no building would have to be torn down, far less traffic, and available green space for, uh, to allow an uh, outsourced park for the kids to run and play in. Possibly looking at the better utilization of the Steeple Square daycare center until, that, until up until recently had to close because they couldn't get staffing for it, which was brought up this evening. You know, there, there's empty space in the Prudential building where classrooms can be put together and then utilize the green space next to it. There, my point being is there are a ton of opportunities to look at. It's not tear down the KC Hall or we're not building a daycare center. What would happen if that block was fully developed with new buildings and there was no opportunity to tear down a building? Are, are you saying that Cottingham and Butler would never go out and look for other options to put a daycare center in for their staff? I would think they would find options. During the Historic Preservation Commission, it was discussed that stakeholders and interested parties would get together to discuss options and find a solution together. When were these meetings ever held? Who attended? I have a question about that. Did they ever happen? During the HPC meeting, the commission requested more information to be gathered by city staff about the historic 
uh, pertinence of the of the KC Hall. That should have been taken care of. Has has the city staff gone out and and done more research to find the importance of that? Because the Jacobson report says more research is needed. That onus fell on city staff to go out and finish that research or hire somebody to do that. It's my belief that that has not been done. It should have been done. So the process itself is what concerns me. It's all these things of us trying to work together. None of it took place. We're not a city that's working together. And what really concerns me is the connection to action item number two to action item number three tonight. So is the KC Hall sacrificed so the city doesn't have to build a parking garage? That's a question that needs to be asked and talked about publicly. If we're supposed to be a community where voices are heard and that things are discussed openly, it has a little bit of feel that things are being done behind closed doors. And I think that it ought to be slowed down. People ought to come back to their senses and get together to discuss the options that are available. There are plenty of options. And I don't think the way some of the folks are addressing the council tonight, saying it's in this location or nowhere or nowhere else is accurate at all. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Terry. Hope you feel better soon. I do too, thank you. Any others there, Corey? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Susan Price has submitted comments to the chat. And Susan, I wonder whether you intend to read those or I can also enter them into the record with the city clerk. Uh, you can just enter it. Okay, if that's okay with you, Mr. Mayor, Absolutely. I will submit yep. them to Adrian. All right, thank you very much, Susan. Are we, so not reading it, just giving to yep, Adrian. Correct, okay. Correct. All right. And there. And at this time, I would invite anyone else, but I don't see any other comments on the online. All right. Thank you, Corey. There has been written input received as well regarding action item number two. Gary Stoppelman of the Dubuque Museum of Art, Andrew Butler, John Butler, and David Becker of Cottingham and Butler, Dwayne Haggerty of Heritage Works, Tom Pekosh of 2310 Simpson Street, Zachary Kentz, Jeanne Kwan, Molly Grover of the Dubuque Area Chamber of Commerce, David Hardig, Rick Dickinson of Greater Dubuque Development Corporation, and Jeff Fossen and Danielle Jacobs of Dubuque Main Street. Okay, thank you, Adrian. All right, then, last call. It's been a good discussion. We appreciate the input. Okay, all right, we can move on to action items then, please, Adrian. Action item number one is Government Finance Officers Association Distinguished Budget Presentation Award. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file. Second. Got a motion by Roussel and a second by Farber. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Director of Finance and Budget Jennifer Larson is transmitting the notification of the City of Dubuque receiving the Government Finance Officers Association Distinguished Budget Presentation Award for the 17th consecutive year. Congratulations, Jennifer. Thank you. Well, congratulations. Does it feel like we need to stop meeting like this? Because it yeah. feels like you're here all the time getting awards for different financial. I know, soon financial... it'll be budget meetings. <laughs> yes, and then, but, and then there's budget meetings in February and March, yeah. You know, I do think it's a good opportunity, though, to, to mention that now is a really good time for the public to be providing input, correct? Yes, that is correct. Um, we do have online opportunities, so we have a budget input, input online form on the budget page of the website. Um, there will be public meetings uh, for each night that the departments present, uh, typically in the month of March and then a final public hearing. So yes, we would love to hear residents' public input. All right, thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Any other comments before we move along? All right, well thank you. And the motion is to receive and file. Adrian, would you call the roll please? Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number two is approval of an ordinance to remove the area bounded by 7th Street, 8th Street, Bluff Street, and Locust Street from the Conservation District. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the communications <coughs> and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended. 
Second by Sprank. Got a motion by Jones and a second by Sprank. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Planning Services Manager Wally Wernemann has provided a thorough review of the request by Cottingham and Butler to deconstruct the building at 781 Locust Street to build a child care facility to service Cottingham and Butler employees and possibly other Dubuque employers with a potential capacity of 182 children. This request was denied by the City Dubuque Historic Preservation Commission. Child care is a need in our community and has been identified in City Council goals and priorities, the Equitable Poverty Prevention Plan, analysis of impediments to fair housing, Imagine Dubuque Comprehensive Plan, and the Downtown Dubuque Master Plan. Cottingham and Butler has received a $3 million state grant to support their efforts to create additional child care slots in downtown Dubuque. The historical significance of 781 Locust Street is questionable. The existing building is not conducive to a modern ch child care facility, and this location is in close proximity to three buildings that house hundreds of Cottingham and Butler employees. The City of Dubuque conducts in-depth architectural historic survey evaluations to help identify properties that are architecturally and or historically significant. In 2003, Historic Preservation Consultant Jim Jacobson of History Pays was contracted to conduct an in-depth architectural historic survey evaluation of the commercial and industrial downtown area. The report traces the physical development of the commercial downtown over its history and identifies the influences which drove, which drove development. The subject city block is located in this survey area. The survey identified that three of the buildings in this block are not architecturally or historically significant, and it was undetermined on the building at 781 Locust Street. The structure is most clearly evaluated in the 2006 ISIF form by consultant Jim Jacobson. The form outlines the history, condition, and integrity of the building in detail, but not to the degree where a formal determination of eligibility is made. The consultant marks all four criteria as more research recommended. And here's what the report said. Because that information is not fully researched, the consultant therefore is not able to make a determination of eligibility and marks the structure as non-eligible. The consultant says, and I quote, the problem, however, is that of integrity. The facade has suffered the complete removal and replacement of its front basement windows, the replacement of the original ground floor window sets, and the infilling of a majority of the second floor facade windows. All of the side and rear wall windows have also been infilled with brick, but it is the facade alterations which are the most troubling. The building would certainly contribute to a district had there been a district to contribute to, but this consultant has to shy away from finding individual eligibility given the extensive facade alterations. The integrity matter renders perhaps mute, moot the possibility for additional research on this building, close quotes. <clears throat> you will see in the material from Wally, Wernemont, the State of Iowa Historic Preservation Office has a differing opinion about the building at 781 Locust Street. At the same time Cottingham and Butler is wanting to deconstruct the building, the Dubuque Museum of Art has recently completed their 2022-2026 strategic plan, which calls for them to, and I quote, build the new community spaces that host, welcome, and connects the community at a dramatic new scale, close quotes. In fact, in 2016, the Dubuque Museum of Art purchased the two buildings on A Street to allow for future facility expansion. The Dubuque Museum of Art is Iowa's oldest cultural institution established in 1874, and it is located in the Dubuque Cultural Corridor as designated by the state of Iowa. The Museum of Art currently owns the other three buildings on the block bounded by 7th Street, 8th Street, Bluff Street, and Locust Street. The Art Museum plans include an intent to make this area a Dubuque Museum of Art campus. Cottingham and Butler is a tremendous corporate citizen and major supporter of historic preservation, as they have done three massive historic preservation projects in downtown Dubuque at the Security Building, 800 Main Street, the Town Clock Building, 823 to 25 Main Street, 
and the Roshek Building, 700 Locust Street. And I do want to go off text just a little bit based on some of the comments that uh, were received about this agenda item. Um, I was surprised that some of the correspondence received about the matter um, questioned uh, Dubuque's commitment to historic preservation. And I would say that the city of Dubuque has one of the premier historic preservation programs in the country. And this is backed up by the city council with investment. So today we just uh, took a thumbnail sketch and look at, at that level of investment. And over the last 15 years, the city of Dubuque has invested over $109 million, which has leveraged over $276 million in private investment. And this does not include the over $240 million the city spent saving the historic North End from flooding with the B Branch Watershed Flood Mitigation Project. And as far as disregarding the Historic Preservation Commission, uh, almost every decision of the Historic <laughs> Preservation Commission is upheld. I respectfully recommend that the Mayor and City Council support these two significant investments that will support workforce development, support businesses investing in downtown Dubuque, and lead to major investments in the Dubuque Cultural Corridor by the Dubuque Museum of Art and Cottingham and Butler by approving the ordinance, removing the conservation district, the block bounded by 7th Street, 8th Street, Bluff Street, and Locust Street. All right. Thank you, Mike. Discussion. Ms. Wethel. For 16 years, my husband and I have had on-site reliable and affordable child care through our employer, hospitals. This includes infant care, shift care, to drop my daughter off before 6 a.m. for a shift, or pick her up after 7 p.m. because I was unable to leave an operating room. Drop off care for snow days or in-service days, summer care for my son. Most recently, during a pandemic, I was able to go to work and care for thousands of patients because I had child care. So why did healthcare figure this out and the need for employer-based daycare decades ago? Because their workforce is made of women. Right now, 85% of workforce at Mercy One Dubuque is women. And when women don't have childcare, they don't run a hospital, plain and simple. When on-site care is available, I can go check on my child while they're recovering from an illness. As a working mother, you can nurse your infant on a break. I recognize that many may not have been able to experience care on site before, but the value of it is immeasurable. <clears throat> Based on labor demographics in the region, it is estimated that 283 to 567 women of working age would return to the workforce if they had affordable and accessible childcare in Dubuque. That does not include women not working before 2019 who might be enticed to return to the workforce. The US Chamber of Commerce Foundation and Iowa Association of Business and Industry, or ABI, published a report and survey titled, Iowa Untapped Potential how childcare impacts Iowa State's economy. When asked, during the past 12 months, did you or anyone in your family have to quit a job, not take a job, or greatly change your job because of the problems with childcare for a child age zero to five years? Single parents answered 36.5% over married couples 17.2. Those with an income of less than 50,000 answered yes 31.2% of the time over higher earners 14.1. Women, they answered 22.3% over men's 13.4. We need to see every decision as a council with a lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And to me, it does not get clearer than that. 
We should always take pause on decisions about our historic structures, and I promise that I have thought of this decision every day since I asked to tour the Knights of Columbus Hall on August 22nd, every day. I have seen every floor of that structure. I've personally reached out to my community to ask for their thoughts. I also have to think of those who aren't yet in Dubuque, but I hope one day will be. I must think of the single mother who's working two jobs and cannot be here tonight. When we have removed properties from a conservation district since 2004, 15 of 24 times, it has been for children. 13 of those were for the creation of the current campus of Prescott School. That is now an anchor for Ward 4 families. Two structures were removed a year ago to create expansion of the Dubuque Dream Center, which because of that expansion, it is now certified care center for families with the ability to feed and mentor and care for our most vulnerable. Our historic structures are crucial part, a crucial part of what brings families to our city, and those structures cannot be replaced once they are gone. I validate those concerns here tonight and those that have reached out to me to save this property. Historic structures are vital to our city, and we must let these decisions weigh on us. They should. But our greatest treasure of all is our children. In this case, 182 of them. They would have childcare. This decision for me is about childcare. It is about them and about equity for those who are most vulnerable and affected by our city's child care crisis. Tonight, I, wanted to, I want to support this ordinance, and I do it respectfully, um, and I appreciate the hard work and commitment of everyone who has reached out to me with their passion and concern, specifically those who serve our city on the Historic Preservation Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wetham. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I agree the Historic Preservation Commission did exactly what they had to do, given the parameters that the ordinance that establishes that commission demands of them. They didn't have the choice to consider all the things that Katie was just talking about. They didn't have that option. They had the option of, let's explore this, um, this request to demolish a building only and not talk about the why. And because that's all they've got. They did the right thing. They did the right job. They always deliver the right job to us. But our job is different. Our job is not to only look at that. Our job is to look at the greater good and the entire package. Of course, historic preservation is incredibly important to this community. It's part of our brand. It's part of who we are. It's what we are every day. We've got 696 structures in five districts. We've got 11 local landmarks and landmark sites. We've got four individual historic properties. Um, nine conservation districts. It's all there and it all matters and it will continue to matter. But then there's this property. In my view, it's an unattractive used up building. It's been cut up, cobbled, and repurposed too many times. Um, previous owners who actually made any and all of the history in that building sold it and walked away from it. They're not looking for historic, pres historic preservation of that structure and they occupied it and created the history that lives there. The new owners are arguably among those who have made the most effort and investment in our city to renovate and preserve Main Street properties and have had preservation experts continue to evaluate the building that are not finding any historic significance of consequence. It could not be more fallacious than to question the motives of the Butler family as relates to historic preservation. They're the real deal. They spent millions and millions of dollars on historic preservation. John Butler is a historian bar none and a humanitarian bar none as well. Over the last several months and years, the Dubuque Museum of Art has acquired every single property on the block except this one. Now, do you think maybe there's a bigger picture at play here? Of course there is. Um, they're looking at a, at a major expansion. They're not quite ready to tell you what and how, but uh, 
We know the people that are on that board. We know the people that are leading that organization. And we know it's going to be spectacular, whatever they bring to the community. Um, so that big picture is really clear. It's going to be a, be a state-of-the-art property expanding arts and culture for all of us in Dubuque. In the middle of it, it's going to be a rebuilt state-of-the-art child care facility desperately needed by employees in downtown Dubuque. Um, the director of the Museum of Arts told us that the museum would welcome the opportunity to display, preserve, interpret, and share the stories of the architectural elements of 781 Locust. So we might be able to see some of that facade restored. We might not. It may not be possible. But that's on their wish list. Uh, so I think everybody's lined up here. Um, Lastly, i got to say historic preservation doesn't mean that every building that has achieved longevity is anything but an old building. Sometimes it's just an old building. I think that's what this is this time. And that's arguable, um, but that's where my argument is. So i got to say, I, we've been accused of some pretty outlandish things by email and otherwise in the last 48 hours. But tonight's action is not the end of historic preservation in Dubuque, Iowa. Um, it's who we are. Maybe the end of this building. Maybe the beginning of a tremendous growth in the arts and culture of downtown Dubuque, as well as an opportunity to grow the downtown workforce. I wholeheartedly support this effort. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Ms. Faber. Thank you. So I echo um, the comments by my two colleagues, and I just want to reinforce the fact that I find this discussion about the amendment uh, to the downtown conservation district is really not to be taken lightly. Uh, it is understandable that this request comes with numerous questions, concerns, as well as some potential solutions. I would like to share with you some of my thoughts because I have a little mosaic here in terms of my background and my interest. Uh, first and foremost, I want to take the time to thank the residents that came here tonight to express their opinions here in the chamber. And over um, the transom, we received over 50 emails between yesterday and today to call through uh, with many thoughts, um, wishes, and desires, not only about child care and the cost and the limited amount of child care available, but also about support for the development and for the contributions that have been longstanding by the Butler family. I'm quite familiar with historic uh, rehabilitation. Uh, since 2004, I have successfully renovated six buildings within Cable Car Square, which now showcase three duplex buildings with both residential and commercial rentals. I know what it takes to architecturally strive to retain historical elements within buildings that date back to the 1850s. And I totally understand the financial commitment required not only to rehab the buildings, but to maintain them over time. I greatly appreciate the ongoing efforts within the city to do the same, but for certain projects, restoration financing can be prohibitive. Cottingham and Butler has demonstrated their unwavering commitment to historic preservation throughout our city, and they have beautifully transformed Main Street with a significant investment in the three buildings and its green space. And so I have to believe that they are reviewing every reasonable opportunity to repurpose the existing building to its best use. Third, as a member of the Heritage Works Board, I have the privilege of staying current on the city's numerous restoration and rehab projects and continue to support these efforts to preserve, when economically feasible, our architectural heritage. And I totally agree that our unique historic fabric is an economic engine for our city. While three of the four buildings are not of historical significance on the block in question, and the commission has not discovered any evidence of Casey Hall's historical significance, I do agree that there are some architectural outstanding features within this building. As the Dubuque Museum currently owns three out of the four buildings within this block, I am pleased to hear about their strategy surrounding the potential development of its new arts cultural campus within this block, an adaptive architectural wall that could incorporate the KC Hall's architectural elements, I think is creative and insightful. Between Cottingham and Butler and the Dubuque Museum of Art, the potential to effectively reuse elements of the KC Hall is indicative of their com commitments to preserve our historic fabric. In summary, the proposed amendment to the Downtown Conservation District 
will enable Cottingham and Butler to review its architectural options for developing its childcare center. Childcare is among our highest workforce and economic development priorities, and this location would effectively serve up to over 100, and, <coughs> over 100 working parents in proximity of their workplace. It is also important to point out that actions like this are always considered on a case-by-case -case basis. The amendment we are considering today leaves this important practice intact. I support this amendment, and I believe the overall impact to working parents, as well as the city at large, is immeasurable. It is the right next step. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Farber. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, Ms. Rousseau. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's clear that our city does have a great commitment to historic preservation. And we received many great comments from residents across the community. And I, I've got several of them here, and I apologize if I don't have your name listed to the comments, but I wanted to share some of them. Um, one was a good reminder that historic preservation and activation is surely a positive for our community. And great work has been done and will continue to be done. But there's always some tension between historic preservation and economic development. If a building has a history but is not historic, we can't let it be a barrier to achieving the needs of our community and the priorities of our council and the future of our community. This is an opportunity to achieve a number of council priorities. And one of the best quotes that I received, and I really apologize because uh, I don't have this person's name, but she said, without the people and Dubuque's ability to add amazing careers, our gem of a city would be nothing more than a sad river town that saw its peak fade with the passing river boom. But that's not us. We hold our roots close as we push forward for a better future. The truest form of investment is in our future. It isn't in a building that doesn't meet the needs of our citizens. It's in the education of young minds and the livelihood of our citizens. It's in helping our city grow by keeping our citizens here and drawing people to town with jobs, knowing that the life they're building in Dubuque isn't just good, it's better than they could ever have imagined. I want to invest in our future with this change. So I'm in support of this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roussel. Mr. Sprank. Um, in construct so I work in construction and I really had a tough, a tough time with this because it's, the building is still functional. It's not falling in. It still is in good condition um, compared to some of the other buildings that aren't, that we do have that we're trying to save that need a lot of attention that we have had to let go. Um, but it's, it's, it's just a different, difficult position to be in. But I also look at the fact that we need daycare, we need childcare. 10 years ago, I approached my employer um, on Kerper Boulevard to, why don't you get together with Anderson and a few other people and see if, hey, build a daycare between all of the companies. Um, that way we'd have shift care. Nobody wanted to take on this liability. Somebody's taking on this liability. That says something to me. Is it in the right location? I don't know. This isn't my business. It's a private business. Um, what really sealed the deal for me today was a let, uh, email I got from an Emily, Emily Glantz, discussing about how she's got three children. Her and her husband have three children, nine, five, and 18. Um, they had issues all of a sudden with daycare. They were on a f nearly a five-year waiting list between NICC, Youngins, and Holy Family. And then in 2022, when their at-home provider person uh, had to close, they were still on a wait list. Luckily, they got in somewhere, and this is costing them an additional $100 per week. It's $5,200, theoretically, they're spending a year. A young couple could be spending that money on their children, on their community, but instead they're having to spend it on daycare. We have, a, we have an employer that wants to help with this issue. I am all for this issue. I want to see this issue happen. And I'm sorry that we have to take out a building that, may, that has pretty much, I view it as run its life. It was historical, but all those aspects have been stripped away. They're not there anymore. Yeah, you can put them back in. There's a cost. So 
I support this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spring. Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, Mr. So. I would like to give credit to uh, Jennifer Koenig for those um, great comments. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Resnick. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, and uh, so my comments are scattered about in notes like this, so I hope you're patient with me. Uh, but I believe that um, Mr. Uh, Jones talked about uh, what we do as a council. Um, and so uh, I think we need to be open-minded and uh, listen to everybody, read everything, and then make our best decision. So that's what I, I think uh, people up here are determined to do that. So here are my notes for this evening. First of all, I would like to say that the Heritage Works is pro-child care. I mean, so it, I don't think it's about child care necessarily as far as our historical folks are concerned. They would just like, like child care in this historic building. So I would like to uh, thank uh, everyone who came and uh, gave us both opinions, uh, but I just want to make sure that uh, Heritage Works is pro-child care. Um, and, and now for the issue at hand, um, so the city commission, as Mr. Jones also talked about, did their, did the right thing. The Historic Preservation Committee uh, Commission did what they were uh, asked to do and said that there is some historical significance and it needs more research. Well, as Mr. Uh, Van Milligan mentioned earlier tonight, the problem <coughs> is the integrity issues of that building render mute the possibilities of, of doing more research. So that's kind of, um, uh, we're kind of down an alley there. And then uh, we got, a, uh, we got a, an email from Mr. Becker today that said that they did, that he did work with Mr. Haggerty and Heritage Works. And they talked for a long time and trying to figure out what could, they could possibly do. And, and Mr. Becker, I'm quoting you, and you say the options produced were unsatisfactory and incompatible to Cottingham and Butler and its employees. And you know, that sometimes happens. Sometimes you're open-minded, you want to find solutions, and it just doesn't seem to work out. Those things happen. So, you know, I get that. Um, so we have an issue. Uh, I would like to say that well, I would like to support the historic preservation of the Dubuque by supporting the Dubuque Museum of Art and their, uh, their coming project. I think it's, it's going to be a wonderful thing for uh, kick off this wonderful cultural corridor that is a possibility down there, uh, starting there and stretching one way or the other, but we're gonna bring in, um, we're gonna, I mean, considering that uh, the Dubuque Museum of Art is such a long tradition of, of uh, you know, they've got a real history here. So I'm glad to support them. And the other thing that really kicked me over was the myriad of heartfelt emails by Cottingham and Butler employers we received tonight. I think you're right, about 50, uh, Ms. Farber. Uh, and asking for the enhanced child care that their company was, uh, was offering, was going to offer, if at all possible. And um, we were looking into child care for, uh, you know, I'm on a, uh, I'm on a, on a board, and it's called Dubuque Initiatives, and they were talking about a child care option and all the different things that need to be done for it to, to be recognized and a legal child care facility. It, it's, very, it's just very difficult to get that done. I think uh, the child care uh, situation that uh, Cottingham Hammond Butler is going to offer their uh, employees is going to be a really good one. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to that. I want to again thank the uh, our uh, Historic Preservation Committee and Heritage Works. All these people have their hearts in the right place. They come up and every person that we got an email from and every person that we heard from tonight and other times wants Dubuque to be a better place. I love that. You know, so I think we're doing our job tonight and uh, I look forward to supporting this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Resnick. <coughs> well, um, sorry, I, I've got like six pages of notes up here and I'm writing one more real quick because this is the kind of night that we have and we have discussions like this. 
So, um, you know, I love it when we show up like this. I really do. It, it makes me appreciate our city so much more. And it makes me appreciate each of you. I mean, everybody's sitting up here, you know, because I, I really respect and appreciate all my colleagues who sit here with me. Um, but, I, but I definitely have a, a deep respect for, for those of you, um, especially those of you that I know well, who are sitting here and who've communicated with us and, and let us know what um, your thoughts are on this. It's pretty clear to me, based on all the feedback that we've received tonight and over the weekend, that um, the city of Dubuque, uh, the, the people of Dubuque, I should say, not the city as a government, but the people of Dubuque clearly care about historic preservation. We really do. I think there are people who are agonizing over this particular situation. And I think um, some of them are definitely sitting up here uh, because you're right, uh, I think it was Mr. Becker who said that you don't envy us. Yeah, I don't envy us either at this moment, but that's the way it goes. Um, because we also um, enjoy the fact that we get to actually hear from everyone and be able to make these decisions that we hope are going to move Dubuque forward in a way that is that we all wanna move. Um, you know, and when we show up, we actually get a really good sense of something that we hear a lot in emails and things, you know, the will of the people, um, what people, what people want. Sometimes um, people throw that term around, but then every once in a while, you actually get to see what that will is based on the number of people who show up. Um, you know, we got a lot of feedback on this particular issue over the last few days. Most of it came today, which was a bit of a challenge, but we, we made it through um, and we're able to read as much as we possibly could and listen to everything that we could. And we appreciate that because it really does help us to get a bigger sense of what this full picture really is. Um, so in my mind, he, here's where we stand. Um, this is not about preservationists versus people who, who don't care about preservation. That's clearly not what this is. Um, it's also not a case of preservation equaling success and removal of a building or removal of this block <coughs> equaling failure. I, I don't think that's where we sit with this. Um, you know, residents of a city and residents of our city, we have to make tough decisions together sometimes. We have to figure things out, and that involves a lot of different things. It involves trust, it involves mutual respect, it involves a little risk sometimes to, to hope that people are gonna make the right decisions as we go forward with things. Um, it also involves discussion, which I think we had tonight. It does involve openness and transparency. It involves a range of emotions. You know, Mr. Jones alluded to the fact that um, some of those emails that we got weren't as, weren't as pleasant as others. And uh, it's kind of what, part of what goes into, uh, you know, what I said earlier tonight about how we can treat each other with respect and with civility when we're sitting in here. And I would hope that we continue to do that when we write to each other. Um, because, you know, I, I want us to walk away from this situation knowing that we are still committed to working together no matter what happens. So. If, if you're keeping count up here, we need six votes to be able to move this forward. I'm hearing six. So this is, this is going, and I'm actually gonna plan to vote for this as well. And as I do so, I do it as a, a person who found myself agreeing with just about everybody who stood up to speak tonight. And that's a difficult spot for, for us to be in because you agree on all these different things, and you know that sometimes when you agree on these things, you're not going to be moving in exactly the same direction. What I hope we can do is as we think about what our collective vision is going forward from this particular situation, what that means for the rest of the downtown area, what it means for the rest of our entire city, that we can continue to build that vision together so that we can move forward in a way that we still have that trust, still have that respect, still see each other as being on the same team, even though sometimes we're gonna have to make decisions that oppose somebody else's views. So thank you very much for speaking up tonight. Thank you for being passionate about this issue and all the issues that we're passionate about. Um, I think that this is, is something that we will be able to move forward together. Um, I do think that the folks that are involved in doing all the work on this block are going to be making some decisions that I, I, I think that we've got a good track record to show us that those decisions are gonna be moving in the right direction for the city of Dubuque. Um, and as we do this, one more thing I wanna address because the slippery slope argument came up a lot. Um, I don't think that this sets a precedent on what this is going to look like in the future. Um, the, Ms. Farber, I believe it was, a case by case basis. That is exactly how this council has addressed this, and that's how um, I know I intend to move forward, and I hope that future councils will as well. And I think that we need to as a community. So with all that said, 
Does anyone have any other parting thoughts before we move on? All right. Well, thanks again for the great discussion. The motion on the table is to, um, it was made by Jones, seconded by Sprank, to receive and file and waive the three readings. So, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. That motion passes 7 0. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Jones? I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second by Sprank. And a motion by Jones and a second by Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number three is resolution approving the fourth amendment to development agreement by and among the city of Dubuque, Rorschach Property, LLC, Cottingham and Butler, Inc., and Heartland Financial USA, Inc. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Farber. I move that we receive and file and adopt the resolutions. Second. A motion by Farber, second by Roussel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Economic Development Director Jill Connors is recommending approval of a Fourth Amendment to the Development Agreement by and among the City of Dubuque, Rorschach Property LLC, Cottingham and Butler Incorporated, and Heartland Financial USA, now known as HTLF. In 2019, due to recent and planned rapid growth of their businesses, Heartland Financial and Cottingham and Butler proposed a plan that would accommodate the growth of each through the collective acquisition of the Rorschach Building by a partnership entity, Rorschach Property, LLC. The development agreement as amended required a collective capital investment of $2,850,000 in specific areas of the Rorschach Building and the creation and retention of employees for Cottingham and Butler and HTLF. It also required the city to design and construct a parking ramp within an identified perimeter of the Rorschach Building to accommodate the additional employees' parking needs. Only a few months after entering into the development agreement, the COVID-19 pandemic caused many employers, including Cottingham and Butler and HTLF, to pivot their operations in order to continue to serve their customers while ensuring the safety of their employees. Due to ongoing patterns of remote work, a third amendment was executed March 10, 2022, to extend the construction deadline of the parking ramp to December 1, 2024. Since the execution of the development agreement, Rorschach Properties, Cottingham and Butler and HTLF have collectively added approximately 90 employees, nearly three times the number required in the original development agreement. In order to better accommodate ongoing remote work patterns that started during the pandemic, HTLF, Cottingham and Butler and city staff have negotiated several changes to the development agreement as follows. Job creation and certification requirements will be stricken. Other examples of major historic rehabilitation projects in the downtown area that do not have job requirements are 210 Jones Street, the Caradco Building, Novelty Ironworks Building, Linseed Oil Building, and the Kretschmer Building. The rehabilitation in and of itself is a significant economic driver and adds to the quality of life in our community. Required building investment is increased to at least $25 million. The original agreement had required an investment of $2,850,000. The completion of a parking facility will be triggered by an impending lack of parking availability as opposed to being required on a date certain. This is in line with the DePaco Voices Project, which commits the city to providing additional parking within two years of having reached 85% capacity in parking facilities with an identified perimeter of the property. Between now and the completion of a new parking facility, if the parking facilities have a waiting list, HTLF and Cottingham and Butler employees will go to the top of the waiting list. This allows the companies to continue to hire as needed without the uncertainty of having adequate parking to support the company's growth. The city agrees to meet with representatives of Cottingham and Butler and HTLF within 60 days of approval of the Fourth Amendment to discuss pedestrian related safety improvements in Locust Street parking ramp and to correct those issues within 12 months, not to exceed $200,000. We believe these collective changes support continued investment from the companies in our downtown while simultaneously providing the city more flexibility in addressing downtown parking needs. 
The current parking utilization in the designated parking ramps is at 65%. While the current deadline in the existing development to build a new parking ramp is December 2024, approval of the amendment will delay the need for a new parking ramp for many years into the future. I concur with the recommendation to amend the development agreement and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Discussion? Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ms. Mr. Jones. Oh, this, is, this is a situation where the right thing that was obvious in 2019 became less obvious through COVID. And what's obvious to me is um, three major players, the city of Dubuque, um, Cottingham and Butler, and Heartland Financial have agreed to do the right thing, which is save the taxpayers this investment for now and uh, come to, a, to reasonable terms to make sure that everybody's getting what they need and not, um, not requiring that the community do things that it doesn't yet need. So thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Barber. Yes, I echo what um, Rick has just said, and I also greatly appreciate the flexibility that Cottingham and Butler and um, Heartland Financial are showing uh, for this mutually beneficial movement um, on the parking ramps. I think it is a solid business decision. Um, and I think it's great that it will be built when and if it's needed. So thank you again for your partnership and your support of the amendment. Thank you, Ms. Farber. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. Uh, just a quick comment. I just think that uh, this is more proof, more evidence that Connie Ann Butler, HTLF, and the city of Dubuque are um, superior corporate entities. They're nimble, flexible, and they share victories uh, that's what we're about here in Dubuque, and I appreciate their cooperation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Well, then I'll just add that I, I just want to say thank you to everyone um, on these negotiations. You know, this is something where um, people had to remain at the table for quite a while uh, through some difficult decisions again. And um, this is one of those things that, you know, it really came down to what was, what was best, not just for the companies involved and for the city of Dubuque, but for the entire community. So I think it's uh, really commendable that everybody was able to agree on, on what we need to do to move forward here. Um, you know, like, uh, like you said, Mr. Jones, you know, this is, a, this is a not yet situation because there still could come a day um, and when we reach this 85% capacity where this is something that's going to be necessary. So I think that's an important thing to be able to say um, that, you know, as, as a city, we need to continue to plan for this. We need to make sure that we have those plans in place, but at the same time, um, right now is not that time, and I think that this is a, a very smart way to move forward. So thank you to everyone who's been able to, to stay at the table and work through this. All right, and with that said, then the motion is uh, to receive and file adopt a resolution. <coughs> motion by Farber, second by Roussel. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number four is work session request, five flags. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and uh, set the work session for Monday, December 5th at 5.30. Second by Wethel. And a motion by Roussel and a second by Wethel. Mike, please. Uh, thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Assuming the Mayor and City Council have approved the amendment to the Roshek Building Development Agreement, which of course you just did, the significant delay in building a new downtown parking ramp that is created by that amendment frees up approximately $18 million in downtown urban renewal debt capacity. Combining this with over $6 million in downtown urban renewal debt capacity that has already been reserved for five flags creates an opportunity to invest in excess of $24 million into five flags in the next few years. While not adding additional seating capacity and retaining the existing building, this level of investment could turn Five Flags into a premier entertainment facility, greatly improving the customer and entertainer experiences. Leisure Services Manager Marie Ware has provided a description of option two that was described in the 2018 consultant's report as costing $18.6 million. $24 million is 29% more than their, 19, or their 2018 number with additional investments to be made in the facility over the next 15 years. Since this $24 million in downtown urban renewal debt is not general fund debt put on the property tax levy, a referendum is not required to issue the debt unless a citizen petition is submitted requiring a, ref a referendum. 
I respectfully recommend that the Mayor and City Council schedule a work session for Monday, December 5th, 2022 at 5.30 p.m. to discuss how to move forward with the Five Flags project. Thank you, Mike. I'll open it up to discussion, but this is one of those funny situations where uh, we are scheduling a work session. We're doing a little earlier, so we probably don't want to have the work session now in the questions that we ask. Just a thought. Mr. Mayor. So, yes, Mr. Jones. Is it possible to to have this work session begin a little earlier and begin with a walking tour of Five Flags? Sure, we could we could do that. It's just across the street. Yeah, is, was 545 or 515 early enough to, to accomplish that? Well, probably maybe five would be probably safer. So I'd, I'd suggest we modify the motion for five o'clock for that purpose. Okay. So moved. So we have the motion to modify to um, 5 p.m. Um, looking at my calendar, does that work for everybody else? I just want to make sure that that's something that we can make happen. Yeah. Okay, everybody's shaking their head yes, so yeah. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Um, Ms. Wethel, you seconded. Would you second that motion? Yeah. Okay, okay. No, yeah, the second time around. The second second. Okay. <laughs> All right, any other discussion, questions? All right, then uh, five o'clock, December 5th, for the work session. Um, motion by Rosales, second by Wethel. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number five is the Butte County Watershed Partnership 28E agreement. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Move to receive and file the documents and uh, view the presentation. I'll second. Got a motion by Jones and a second by Roussel. Uh, Mike? Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. City Engineer Gus Sahoyas is providing information about the watershed agreement with the County of Dubuque and the Dubuque Soil and Water Conservation District that has allowed the city to continue to collaborate on addressing stormwater flooding and water quality issues on a watershed basis beyond the limits of its jurisdictional boundary. Civil Engineer 2 Darren Muring and Watershed Program Director Eric Schmeckel have prepared a short presentation to outline some of the successes of the Watershed Agreement Partnership. All right, Darren and Eric, thanks for coming. The floor is yours. Uh, Darren Mearing, uh, Civil Engineer. Um, good evening, Mayor, uh, City Council, staff. Um, so Eric and I can talk easily for 90 minutes on this. <laughs> we are not. Um, respectful of everyone's time, but we do appreciate the opportunity just to go over some of the you know, successes of our, our watershed partnerships. Um, when, when we've been talking as a city uh, over the past several years, we've really focused, a lot of the attention's been on the B Branch watershed, which is shown in kind of dark green here within the Dubuque's corporate limits outlined in red, and then you can see where we all are within the, the county, uh, water, or county uh, um, area. Um, but again, recognizing that watershed, there's other watersheds that impact the city of Dubuque, one being the Catfish Creek, and you can see here on the image that it extends well outside of our uh, corporate limits. Um, but as most know, the Catfish Creek flows through our city, uh, fl flows through the mines of Spain into the Mississippi River. Uh, so obviously we have a you know, um, vested interest in what goes on out outside of our city within the watershed because the health of the Catfish Creek definitely uh, de uh, depends on what goes on in the watershed. And so that was really the uh, uh, reason behind forming this partnership uh, with uh, the County of Dubuque and uh, Dubuque Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, one of the uh, programs the city has that uh, is related to this partnership is that we have a permit uh, through the state that allows us to discharge our stormwater into what are called waters of the United States or really the Mississippi River. And one of the things that uh, through this partnership, uh, um, the Soil and Water Conservation District performs inspections on our behalf as part of our permit requirements. Uh, for example, looking at construction sites, making sure they have adequate road and sediment control, making sure they're being maintained, uh, basically trying to avoid what's shown and pictured on the right there where uh, sediment is obviously leaving a construction site. And of course, why that's important is because if it leaves a construction site, it gets into our stormwater system, it discharges into the Catfish Creek, and the image here is showing where the catfish uh, empties in the Mississippi River. You can see the, the sediment load in the, in the catfish. 
Um, the other reason for the partnership has to do with our Water Research Recovery Center and nutrient reduction uh, goals there. Um, we have a, our, our current permit requires us to have a nutrient reduction strategy to reduce uh, phosphorus and nitrogen, uh, basically from when it comes into our plant to reduce it by X amount before we discharge it. Um, and so we've been uh, working with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources on how we would accomplish that. Um, we've looked at it in 2015 and you know, we could do upgrades at the treatment plant, but that's not always the most cost effective way to address uh, nutrients. Um, even, and one of the reasons is, is that even the Iowa Department of Natural Resources recognizes that 92% of uh, phosphorus and nitrogen, for example, in, in the watershed comes from non-point source pollution. And so again, looking out in the watershed is going to be the most cost effective way to try to reduce that. And so uh, more recently, we expanded uh, the agreement and the partnership um, and to really, you know, look, work with the uh, Dubuque County, work with the Soil and Water Conservation District to really uh, work out in the county with them and other uh, state and federal agencies um, and to really, you know, maximize everyone's effort to try and address those, that nutrient reduction. Um, and, and this partnership really uh, advanced that quite a bit recently. Um, so, for example, I mentioned um, the, the Soil and Water Conservation District. Mr. John Wiley uh, is an employee of theirs, an urban water co coordinator. He's the one who does a lot of inspections on behalf of the city um, and also uh, on behalf of, the, of other communities and the county um, looking at, uh, you know, water quality issues. Um, there's also a, a conservation agronomist. Um, uh, Mr. Scott Hendricks was just recently hired, uh, had been previously filled by Zach Timms, who had been for, with us for two years doing that work. And uh, what uh, that position does is really goes out into the uh, watersheds, into the county, works with property owners, tries to bring the information to them, bring them the programs, uh, versus just uh, the NRCS office waiting for a farmer to call. Um, we, we go out there and proactively engage uh, landowners. Uh, and then, of course, Eric Schmeckel, Watershed Program Director, who will be talking in a little bit. He oversees their work, um, but he also works directly with the city, works directly with me, works directly with the county, uh, obviously works with the Soil Water Conservation District, works with the um, uh, NRCS on a, a lot of different programs to kind of help coordinate everything we do uh, in the watershed as part of the program or the partnership. Um, one of the first things that the partnership produced was the formation of the Catfish Creek Watershed Management Authority. Uh, basically a citizen board that, um, you know, is concerned about what goes on in the watershed. And, um, you know, they're not a non-taxing authority. They don't have their own checkbook. So anything they do is either has to be grant funded or funding from either the county, the city, the uh, Soil Water Conservation District, or like I said, grants. Um, through a grant, they were able to uh, develop a, a watershed plan for the Catfish Creek, you know, identifying many of uh, the practices that could be implemented. Uh, to address some of these issues, um, such as like stream bank stabilization or uh, whatnot. One of the ways that we were, as a city, were able to provide some funding uh, for the Catfish Creek Watershed Management Authority is through uh, the state's SRF uh, loan sponsorship project. Um, it's one of the reasons why we like the SRF loan as a way of funding some of our improvements, our capital improvements. So this is an example where we funded the uh, Upper Bee Branch Creek Restoration Project with a roughly a $16 million loan. And as part of that, uh, we, were, we were to pay up roughly $3.5 million in interest uh, on the life of that loan. Uh, that's what the citizens will be paying. But as, as, a, as a sponsorship project, the, the state allows you to refinance that loan, uh, essentially reduce the interest you would pay back on the loan and offset re that reduction increased in principal, in this case $1.4 million, that then could be used by the Catfish Creek Watershed Management Authority to allocate uh, on the various practices and, and, and uh, programs identified in that uh, watershed management plan. Um, so here's some of the examples of some of the practices they've been able to allocate funding for. So this is a, a creek that was actually um, behind where the Simmons facility is behind, on Chavanel Road, a city-owned property, highly erosive before. Uh, another similar improvements was on Swiss Valley Park. People might have noticed this over the summer. I guess another phase is uh, still coming up. Um, uh, and then some farm field practices, building ponds to capture sediment and the nutrients that go along with that. Um, here's one that was uh, kind of more in town. That's 
Uh, the street there on the left is Barbara Lee, um, and so this is just kind of south part of town. So this is a residential property that someone was a, a residential property owner with the help of, of this program was able to address, uh, you know, an erosive uh, ditch running through their property and, and be able to capture some of the nutrients. Um, and another one is soil quality restoration. So any, any residential property within the uh, Catfish Creek watershed could take advantage of this to increase the organic com content of their, their uh, soil. And what that can do is reduce the amount of times you have to put uh, fertilizer down. It just uh, it holds, holds uh, um, just grows grass better and whatever you're going to grow there. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Eric to talk a little more about the Catfish Creek and other things that the program's been doing out in the county. Eric Schmeckel, Watershed Program Director with the Stone Water Conservation District. And echoing what uh, Darren just said, thank you for uh, taking the time really tonight just about really kind of sharing the success we've had. I've been with the district for 15 <coughs> years. Uh, our new 2080 agreement, I guess, is in place now for about three years. Um, so we're just excited to keep this thing moving. So much of what we do is, is working with, you know, working on relationships with landowners, whether it's urban and rural. Um, a lot of the focus the last few years has been in that, in that rural divide and working with our farmers and our land use issues. But um, I get to finish up here with like 10 slides, with mainly pictures, so it won't be long. But <laughs> our watershed board does meet monthly. Um, we've got about $90,000 left. We spent $1.4 million. Uh, this has been going on now, I think, since 2017. A lot of good programs, a lot of good projects, a lot of urban landowners have taken advantage of that soil quality restoration program. And then our, our, uh, our farmers have taken advantage of some of our agricultural programs as well too. We also cost share on cover crop programs as well too. Um, though two, two more people that Darren didn't mention, I know you saw John and our newly hired uh, conservation agronomist, Scott Hendricks. Uh, we were able to be, we were successful enough to, to win an award in 2017 through the NRCS. The city of Dubuque was the lead applicant on that Iowa Partners for Conservation. Um, and really, it was, it's all about farmer engagement. It allowed us to continue to write conservation plans for farmers, to engage with them and talk to them about different incentive packages that are available and help coordinate and leverage all the different state, federal, and local programs that are out there because it gets rather complicated and there's a lot of paperwork that goes into it. And having a solid roadmap on your farm is the first step, I think, to more profitability and sustainability. Outreach has really never ended. Uh, you know, we've done, we've, we've done these field days now for the last three years. Um, they've been really successful, anywhere from 100 to 150 people in attendance. Farmers listen to farmers. It's, it's an opportunity for them to come together to learn from their neighbors, to learn from their peers on farming practices and what we're, what we're trying to do here in Dubuque County. You maybe have seen our slogan, Roots in the Ground Year Round. It's all about having a living root system year round, regenerative agriculture, and how can we incre increase their bottom line? How do we increase their profitability, not just focus on top yields, but inputs and outputs on our, on our programs. This past year, we did our first Farm Brew Social. I, I would encourage you, if possible, to come out next year. I think it's going to be an annual event. Eric Miller is a farmer down by Cascade that is uh, selling malt to local breweries in the state of Iowa, so it was fun to make that connection. Um, and we had Mitchell Hora from Continuum Egg. A lot of, a lot of good feedback, and, uh, and, and honestly, a lot of farmers that had, I hadn't seen before came out to that event this past summer. Real quickly here, just the Dubuque County, you know, ha, has been uh, a very, a very great partner the last few years, ramping up uh, our land stewardship fund in Dubuque County. They're contributing around four hundred sixty-five thousand dollars of local tax dollars from the general fund that are that are uh, supplying these these programs with doll with dollars. Our Stormwater Outcomes Fund, Chutera, uh, both really good programs. Both really good organizations that have recently aw were awarded $90 million each uh, through the cl Climate Smart Commodities. Of course, carbon is the next big thing I think that you're probably hearing and learning about with farmers and how we're sequestering carbon in our soils and how can farmers be involved with that. So that's another thing kind of on the horizon that, that we're involved with as well. So like I mentioned, $465,000 local dollars. We're leveraging that with state and federal uh, dollars 
uh, as appropriate um, when these programs come up and when we're able to create contracts with, with producers. Like Darren said, this presentation should be a lot longer than 15 minutes, but you know, just a quick glance at what we did last year. This is our, our partnership with Lando Lakes and our friends up in Minnesota. We were the first uh, community in the Midwest to pilot the Chutera uh, sustainability insight engine, but it's essentially working with farmers on a sustainability score on their farm and then using profitability, their existing land use data, and looking at what conservation practices we can plug them in, nutrient management, cover crops, reducing tillage, and we're paying them for those sustainability point increases. Uh, so this past year we reached 33 farmers, 43 different farms, and, and just over 3,400 uh, 3, acres, which was an increase from 2021. Same thing with the outcomes fund. This is a more of a pay for performance type program. Where we're paying farmers for reducing nitrogen and phosphorus inputs, typically through the use of cover crops in the, in the fall and the spring. And then lastly, our, our ecosystem services uh, is another funding mechanism set up to try and pay for some of the, the more structural edge of field components. So your wetlands, your ponds, your sediment basins, things that are typically a little bit more expensive than just your, your in-field management practices. But here's a couple of pictures of two structures that were built this past year. The latest program that we launched here, fiscal year 23 this past July, is a brand new buffer incentive program. We have struggled in Dubuque County to get our, our waterways lined with healthy buffers. Um, this is another incentive package. Our goal is to get 50 more acres a 50 foot of stream buffer throughout Dubuque County. We're doing this by incentivizing those landowners in, co in collaboration with FSA and the CRP program to get farmers up to $450, $500 an acre per rent under a 10 year contract for installing a perennial buffer along a waterway. Recently, um, outreach doesn't end. You know, uh, one, of the, one of the latest grants that we were awarded was an Iowa DNR sign grant We'll be installing 50 signs throughout Dubuque County this year, labeling all of our smaller watersheds through Dubuque County so you know what watershed you are leaving and entering uh, throughout the community. I know that was really quick. I know it's been a long meeting. So again, I just thank you for the time tonight to, uh, to let Darren and I talk about the success of our watershed program. Uh, well, thank you. I mean, we, we sincerely appreciate you being here uh, to be able to talk to, this, to talk to us about this. So. Questions or discussion? Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Resnick. Question. So uh, I guess my concern is I, I read in the popular press things like hog lagoons that spill into creeks and their potential eco disaster. Do we have, what actions can we take to prevent this uh, or ameliorate the occurrence? Do, and does the buffer program also help with that occurrence? Most of the most of the larger <coughs> hog facilities, we would rely on our NRCS and DNR. DNR does a lot of the permitting on some of those nutrient management plans, um, but most of the larger hog facilities we rely on NRCS to install nutrient pits and to install manure pits in in those operations in those fields. Um, so they're more structural in nature. Um, we're not regulatory. Our 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 watershed team uh, is not regulatory in the means of analyzing those things. We're, they're trying to help and incentivize what programs are there to offer. We also do have, and something that wasn't talked about tonight in this, in this quick PowerPoint, was a, a pretty robust monitoring system. John Wiley has led a, a, a number of different volunteers this year. We, we partner with the University of Dubuque, and we've taken a lot of water samples throughout Dubuque County. So it's something that we're looking for hot spots in, in those areas as well, too. OK, great, thanks. Um, just one of the things, and I don't know if this would be covered under this, but, but part of the program is, is for the Waldos to actually go and write conservation plans for farms. So they will sit down with them and figure out okay, how they operate, put practices where it makes sense to try to, like I said, conserve and keep things on the farm. So it may not directly address the situation you're talking about, but it's similar in that that's one way we can uh, work with them to, um, you know, on a volunteer basis to install practices. Um, Great. Right. Thank you. And um, uh, lastly, are you getting any ARPA funds? And if so, how do you plan to use them? The, the, uh, uh, the watershed team is not getting any ARPA funds. Uh, we have a, an, a, 
We, have, we are a supporting role to the Sustainable Iowa Land Trust. SILT has hired a Dubuque County Land Scout to look at permanent conservation easements at uh, landowners in Dubuque County that would be interested in growing lo locally produced food. So we do have a newly hired Dubuque County Land Scout and that, in that we're a supporting partner in that, um, in that role. But we don't, we don't specifically have any ARPA funds. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, absolutely. Any others? All right. Well, I'll just reiterate then, thank you so much for this update. It really is good to get this. Um, and I know we're welcome also to attend the, the meetings that you have. Um, the, and can you remind us when those meetings are held too? Yeah, absolutely. We, so the, the 28E agreement, we have uh, two meetings a year. Um, we cover quite a bit of content, but we get into a lot more of the details and it would be great to have uh, anyone from city council, uh, the, the meetings are open to the public, obviously, to, to attend those meetings and to learn more about our programs. Yeah, I found it educational and I was able to attend last yeah, year. Yeah, thank so you, I, thank I you for really coming. I appreciated that, so. All right, well, thank you very much for the time tonight. All right, so motion was to receive and file and hear that presentation. So, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number six is B Branch Treat Creek Trail Phase One Project. Mr. Mayor, I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Sprank. Motion by Resnick, second by Sprank. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. City Engineer Gus Sahoyas is recommending City Council adopt the resolution to award the public improvement contract for the B Branch Creek Trail Project Phase One Iowa DOT project, 8131, to Chig Fry Excavating Company of Dubuque in the amount of $604,809.62, subject to the Iowa Department of Transportation concurrence and approval of the award. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion? All right. Seeing none, motion by Resnick, second by Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number seven is amending ordinance 32 38 22 for the Derby Grange Road housing urban renewal area. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed to be suspended. Second by Wethel. Motion by Jones and a second by Wethel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Economic Development Director Jill Connors is recommending City Council adopt an amendment to Ordinance 3822 for the Derby Grange Road Housing Urban Renewal Plan by removing property from the Division of Revenues within the Derby Grange Urban Renewal Area. The removal of property from the amended ordinance for the Derby Grange Road Housing Urban Renewal Area is necessary to accommodate the creation of the new John F. Kennedy Road Urban Renewal Area. The right of way does not generate any tax increment from increased development in the area. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, we have a motion by Jones and a second by Wethel to receive and file and waive the three readings. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Jones. I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second. Motion by Jones and a second by Wethel. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. <coughs> Action item number eight is trash cart distribution update. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file and view the presentation. Second by Farber. And a motion by Resnick and a second by Farber. I don't think it can come directly to you. Good evening. <laughs> I'm John Closer and I'm the Public Works Director. With me tonight is Assistant Public Works Director Ariel Swift and Resource Management Supervisor Jake Jansen. And tonight we'd just like to bring you up to speed on where we're at with our project in which you uh, approved last year in the fiscal budget. That's our automated collection and our cart distribution for trash. I'll have Ariel uh, bring that up. 
and walk you through that. Uh, Just a sorry. Hey, while we're doing that, Eric, if you wouldn't mind, could you get the screens at the desk to be um, to, to not be showing the feed instead, so we can see the, just the presentation? If, if that's possible, please. Right. Errol Swift, Assistant Public Works Director. I know you're thinking, no videos tonight, though, so we should be good. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to figure out how to work PowerPoint. We've got it. Is it going? We can see it. We can see it. We have it. We have, we have it. it. Give it one. You guys have it. Got it. Sorry. Um, cart update. <laughs> um, we're very excited about this project. Um, Jake came on board after, or right around the time that it was approved, and he's really just taken it all the way. Um, so it, it's really exciting. So again, the overview, three years program between the automated arms and the carts, two years for the carts, three years for the arms. About 15,000 carts is what we're um, anticipating. Uh, some deliverables that we've gotten completed, uh, we have officially gotten everyone switched over from the oversized or the additional carts. Um, that was kind of an, a confusing piece of our thing that we've been really trying to get away from and so those are finally moved over uh, successfully. I believe Jake in our front office ended up calling like 250 of the customers um, trying to reach out and, and get them in this cart that they want. Um, and a lot of them did go to a smaller size so that was kind of really exciting to see. Um, our backlog and wait list, um, as you know, we always run out of carts before we get a new um, inventory in by the end of the year. I think it takes like two and a half months before we're through the budget typically. Um, but now that we have the carts on hand and we're going to be ordering them, um, they should be here middle of February, the large 8,000. Um, and we haven't started a, a wait list yet, so that's good. <laughs> we still have quite a few in inventory. We did increase the number that we ordered to get us through the winter, so, um, but we did clean up that wait list. It was over a thousand people in and various sizes on that cart wait list by the time we got these in. As everyone knows, logistics has been hit or miss sometimes. Um, delivery and tracking, so we've really been working very closely with um, Public Information Office, and I mean every single person. Uh, the social media, the videos that you guys saw two weeks ago, um, GIS, every single aspect. Uh, and, and they've, I, I almost feel like they're in public works at this point just because they've done all of this great work for us. Um, and a big piece of that is the delivery and tracking of these cards. So we have a thousand people on this wait list. How do we deliver them in the most efficient way possible? Um, so utilizing GIS and working with Nikki um, in public information office, we were able to create this form so we input this information and it populates on a map so they're able to filter out by what size. So we load up this big old truck with like, I don't even know, like 30 96 gallon carts and they're just able to go to one area and drop it off. Boom, 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 boom. But they're also taking pictures. They're also capturing it right there at that address and linking it back to the utility billing. Um, so we're able to remove a, a weekly report that Nikki had to manually do um, through that process. And then outreach and education, again, <coughs> big, big shout out to Public Information Office um, with just everything that we've done. So again, the discontinued services, um, that was 440, just over 440 uh, customers that we had, what, it was approved around April 1st, so we had um, two months to get everyone swapped over um, into a cart when we didn't have carts yet because we had to wait for the new funding source to order them. Um, but we did it very successfully. You can see here, so this is kind of the mess that um, an oversized cart could kind of leave. There's no lid on it. It's not, you know, animals can get into it. Scavengers can get into it. Um, and so we're able to clean that up. So this is the deliveries that we've been doing. Um, as you see, August, we did 934. Um, and that does not include the oversize, because we did all of those in July. Because uh, as of July 1st, they weren't being charged for it, so we definitely needed to get them in the right uh, cart size. And a big piece of this is because of the GIS. So this is a map of what it looked like 
when I created this presentation. Um, and so every day these things populate, the yellow ones are the yellow bins, uh, the blue ones are the blue recycling carts and then the dots are just different size trash carts. Here's what it looked like when we first implemented the GIS. This is how many they've delivered, both recycling, yard waste and refuse since probably mid-August is when this, this kind of got up and running. Poor Nikki, so I just kind of like threw something together and now Nikki has to go back and fix everything that I did. Um, but she's, gonna, she's doing a great job and, and she's, she's so close to getting it done and ready to go live so that citizens can also input their requests without having to call if that's an option that they'd like to do. So in the field, this is what it looks like. Um, they go to the address, they pop up on the map, it automatically goes to their location using the phone's GPS. Um, they click on a dot and this is the information that pops up. It automatically captures the delivery date based on whatever time they click on that data point. Um, they take a picture and they send it on through. I mean, it's very easy. They're even able to scan the text from the cart to remove that human error of entering. And then it's also live updates for office staff. So typically, um, and well, historically, it has been, oh, is my cart delivered? I'm not at home, I'm at work, I just wanna know because it was supposed to be delivered today, da da da, and then they'd be like, uh, hold on, let me talk to the truck. So then they'd have to go to the radio and talk to them and be like, well, no, it's this person, not this person, he must be out of the car. So it was just like a lot of back and forth communication. This gives them that live update. Um, they have an update of both delivered and non-delivered, again using GIS dashboard, so they're able to search by address, it tells them what the cart number is, they can say yes, it was delivered on this day by this person, um, it should be out there. Especially because a lot of times we have snowbirds, and so they're not in town, they'll be like, oh, I just want to make sure I can call my neighbor to like bring it back towards my house. Um, so it's been super useful for that as well. And then outreach. Um, if Jake wants to go more into this, he absolutely can because he's really the one that kind of has been working with Kelly very closely on this. Um, so here's our plan going forward. In December, doing a social media post uh, for a proper cart set out so that we kind of get that information out and people can get it in their minds before they get their carts. Uh, January, utility billing insert for proper set out. Again, just kind of reiterating it and getting that in people's um, heads and kind of almost like brain muscle memory. <laughs> um, so they do it right from the, from the get go. Um, and then that's when we'll push out Nikki's form uh, for the claim your cart. And that's not just for refuse carts, that also gives them the option to sign up for yard waste, food scraps, um, and any, either the recycling bins or um, recycling carts. February, releasing the cart video that I talked about last time we were here. Um, I got some really, really great shots. Uh, a lot of drone pictures too, which are like, those are my favorite. Um, Cause you really get like to see the whole picture and who you're impacting and how you're impacting them. Uh, recollect notification on Claim Your Cart. As you know, we have the Rethink Waste app. Um, so we'll be able to use this, uh, that app to put a banner up top to notify people like, hey, you can now use this. Here's a link to it. Uh, I believe you also have worked with Nikki on creating brochures with a QR code saying, hey, if you wanna do this, here's proper set out and also here's a QR code to go fill out this form if you'd like. Continuing to distribute carts with an informational flyer, they're developing that to place with the cart when we put it, um, when we deliver them on the routes. So that they get the cart and they get the informational and it's not like, okay, now I need to call, now I'm confused about this and that. Um, and they're working really hard on that. They're going over it and they're, they're um, almost like focus groups. They're, <laughs> they're getting other people's uh, input on it. People who maybe don't know as much about the carts yet and saying, hey, is this confusing for you or not? So that we can get that live feedback before we push it out everywhere. Um, and then attending community events, doing car promotions. Um, in May we also have our Public Works Week, which we do a farmer's market. It was a huge hit last year, huge hit. It was surprising how many people didn't know anything about carts. <laughs> um, especially because it's been, for us, it's been a hot topic. We've been very excited about it for years. Um, and really, really positive feedback. And then again, just continuing to attend community events doing cart promotion. Uh, so we ordered over 3,000 carts in various sizes this fall. Um, we still have about 1,500 in various sizes left. So it should get us through to February. And in February we'll get 8,000 and that's when we'll do 
a push out of the carts. And those are all 35s. So here are some info samples. Do you want to go over some of the pictures that we have? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, so on the slide there, there's a few different um, uh, handouts that we have um, and different pictures. But like you see at the very top, um, there's a, it's a decal, it has a QR code. Um, it says trash only. Um, just really clear and concise information that goes on the very, that is being delivered on the top of the cart. Um, so clear information to the customer. Set it out at 6 a.m. It needs to be pointing this way towards the curb. There's arrows, so just clear direction there, and the QR code links to more information. Um, that image on the um, right, it's right size your cart. Um, and so it's, you can see there's you know, our four different cart sizes kind of giving good imagery of you know, a 35 gallon cart is best for households that generate two to three kitchen bags per week. Um, that, in my opinion, is getting that image out there. Um, but the plan is, is to put it into a utility bill insert in January. Uh, just kind of educating our community that, you know, we're, we have a pay as you throw system and we don't want you just to get a 35 and say, well, it's the cheapest option. And then we get a call and say, oh, this, isn't, this is too small. Um, we need a bigger cart. Well, this cart doesn't work, but really getting that visual because the resources, the, the gas, the time is really hard. We need to make sure we appropriately right size your cart. Um, got a recycling sticker up there as well. Um, that we developed um, through a Dubuque Metropolitan Area Solid Waste Agency grant. Um, so a lot going on with public outreach. And I believe it was the, um, the commission who suggested a sticker on all the recycling, right, to decrease mm -hmm. contamination. So those stickers are going on every single recycling, yellow bin um, and blue card as well. So it, it was a really great initiative to work with them and I believe Green Core as well. Um, yeah. yeah, a little bit. So here's a sample of that Recollect Rethink Waste app, and there's that banner that I'm talking about. So that is where it'll say, here's where you can go to sign up for your cart, and that right size your cart image is also on that form as well. So <laughs> when they're signing up, they have that visual. Um, it has the price and the size um, and all the information that they should need. And there's always an option to also give us a call, obviously. We're always willing to talk to people. Um, it's what our front desk is really great at. <laughs> They're way better than I could be at it. Um, yeah, they're awesome. Um, so then this is the timeline for the overall CART implementation. Um, just a very big, broad overview. Um, so we're going to start a CART audit. Um, so the plan is when there's not snow, hopefully the, the street crews will be able to assist and follow uh, recycling carts, or recycling trucks, and refuse trucks, and go around and capture on set out day, what carts are where. So we have a very clean base, because we've been pushing out a lot of carts for a lot of years, and so it's just a really good way to make sure we got a nice, clean database to start with as we, before we push out the 8,000 in February. Uh, getting that clean data, um, planning out deliveries for spring, we're still bouncing around a couple of ideas on how, how the best way to implement that is, because some people don't want a cart right now, and that's absolutely fine. Um, they still have a little bit a little while, but those might be the people that maybe we need to send some special information to um, or have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with. In January, finalizing work order process and delivery plan, so that again would be with Nikki and Public Information Office. I mean, she's doing a whole work order system, so the request comes in, it goes to a specific driver or specific, specific truck, um, so it doesn't matter if someone's sick, someone else will be able to step right in and um, the utility billing insert, again, like he, like Jake said, it would be the right size your cart. In February, the carts arrive. So during that month, we'll probably end up assembling them, getting them ready to go, uh, lining them all up, getting a good inventory of what we have, adding that to that work order system, um, so that again, they can just do a drop down of cart number or start typing in and it starts populating for them um, to really clean up that data. Prepping for delivery, um, removing any wait list that we might have. Again, we're not anticipating a wait list. It's only three-ish months, knock on wood. Um, <laughs> we did really, really well so far. Um, so removing any wait list that might occur, uh, doing social media and videos. And then March through July, beginning continu continuing deliveries, outreach and education, um, evaluation of the Tyler integration with utility billing and seeing if we can't remove maybe some dupl duplicitive 
processes in the meantime, um, especially since Tyler has Esri integrated. Um, we also just piloted um, a program with Rubicon for a, it was a lot of stuff. So it was ELD devices, so information <laughs> on the trucks to make sure the pe drivers are being safe while they're trying to be efficient on their <laughs> the things, so they're not braking and turning and stuff too hard. Um, and it was free, it was a free pilot, and we got some really, really great data from it. So we're hoping to implement that data that we got from them um, for free, which is great, um, moving forward uh, when we go to integrate with utility billing, um, our community plus I think is right now into Tyler. And that's it. All right. It's a lot of information, very short period of time. Uh, it's very helpful though, thank you very much. I'm sure this is just one of many of these because we, we really like this program, it's amazing. <laughs> so I think you hope, you know, we've been able to show you that we've done a lot of work on the back side of this in order to prepare not only our staff, but our community for this changeover. And an exciting program for us. We're, we're excited about having that. We have two automated trucks on order right now that we're looking for delivery by next fall. Now, that is, they were ordered earlier in the spring, so they're going to be well over a year before we get them. But uh, hopefully they can stay on that schedule. That is a, that is a, a supply chain issue that we've seen with trucks, regardless on what type it is. So. Hopefully we'll have those two trucks. We will be coming to you again for uh, another automated truck uh, in the five-year program. And uh, uh, I think it's a great program, uh, not only for the department, which of course one of the main, one of the main areas is to protect our employees uh, on that repetitive lifting thing, but I think it's gonna be great for the community too. So we thank you for your uh, support. Well, thank you, John. And yes, yes. Mr. Frank. Uh, Thank you for all that lovely good information because, you know, I was adamant for the smaller carts, so I'm happy to see that. Um, I was thinking 8,000, that's a lot, uh, and I get it. Would it be easier just to kind of contract out somebody to deliver them once you've got them all put together and you just, like, have a couple guys, uh, you know, a bunch of people driving around just dropping them off? Cause, yeah. So we've, we've looked at that option. That's definitely an option that, you know, we're still evaluating. Uh, we think if we do it with our own staff, there's some buy-in that goes along with that also. Uh, there's some community uh, uh, interaction when we're out doing those type of things. We just have to see how it all works together, but we are evaluating that as an option uh, as we move forward. Thank you. Yeah. Ariel Swift again, uh, Assistant Public Works Director. So also what we did notice with August being 900, that's the most we've ever been able to do. And a big piece of that is that GIS aspect, which we're already paying for. Um, poor Nikki's paying again, she's paying a little more than the rest of us, but um, once she's getting that work order system in, we'll be able to do even more. I think at one point we did about 450 in that first week. So uh, we, we did talk to the crews and they do feel like they could do it. Um, they are on, on incentive pay, so not all of it would be on overtime. Um, you know, we'd be able to spread it out, but yeah, I and a, definitely the community outreach. Um, the crews, their favorite part is when like the kids come out and talk to them. So it would just give them another opportunity to kind of interact with them and hand out stickers and kind of talk to people about, you know, yeah, actually we don't collect glass curbside, but here's some other places that you can go. Because yeah. they know more about our operations than anybody that would we'd contract out. Sorry. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd just like to explain their, the comment about incentive uh, pay. So the way refuse collection works is all, they all have their route to finish, and once the routes are finished, they go home. So if it takes eight hours or it takes six hours. Now the rule is nobody goes home till everybody goes home. So if somebody's not done with a route, everybody can go help them get done. So then everybody can go home, but that creates this extra time in an eight hour day where something like this can get done without paying overtime, even though there might be some overtime with, you know, delivering this many carts, but that's the way the incentive pay program works. Got it. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, Mr. Resnick. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, I'd like to promote recycling a little bit. So when they complain that 35 gallons is too small, well, maybe they could recycle more. I don't know if it's a nice way to suggest that. Uh, they recycle more or they pay more, and that's the choice. Uh, but uh, it sounds like, you know what's a, a winner for me is when customers find how sturdy find out how sturdy it is and how much if they were going to pay for one of those actually go and buy one 
how expensive those wonderful quality products are. So uh, that's another thing you can, when you call them, can we show you how sturdy these things are? You know, I can see why you get excited about the program and about the product because I think it's excellent. I do have a question though. You talked about, uh, and it's about user feedback, and you mentioned that um, really positive feedback at these community events. Uh, and I was wondering, have we received any <laughs> constructive criticism where that we can use to make things better? Have you received comments like that? Um, I mean, I think it, it depends on the person you're asking, but generally, most part, you know, they get the wrong message of, you're making me buy a cart. No, you're paying $15.38 and we're actually providing you the cart. And then it, it, you kind of talk them down to that. But as far as criticism, um, maybe for, you know, folks that have very small properties and have stairways and are, would like to keep their cart in their garage um, and there's no room in their garage, I think that sometimes comes to be a critique. But, you know, many other communities, they're storing your cart on the side of a house um, is, is very, very doable. Um, so... But. Sure, I mean, there are things that can't be helped, but uh, sometimes you can take those comments, and uh, maybe, John, you can help, uh, that they, uh, they make a comment, and it's almost like a suggestion box where, hey, that, you know, that might be a good idea. Have, have there been any of those, or is the program too new? We, Jake takes most of those calls, and that's why we're going to have him answer those questions. But uh, I think to date it's been very positive. We want to make sure that anybody that does have questions can come down and see the carts that we have available. We have what we call the cart corner, so you can come down and see all the carts. Jake will be happy to talk to them and go through any issues they have with them. But Jake, do you have any follow-up on that? I think I covered it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Samir. Thank you. All right, well, Jake, Ariel, John, thank you very much for this update. I think it's really helpful. I know the, uh, the communities curious about what's going on, so it's nice to get this update, and I'm sure we'll see you again once the snow's done flying, so we know where things are going, so. Yeah. Perfect. And I'll just say one last thing, that, you know, the 19 sanitation drivers on staff, I mean, they're committed to going fully automated, and to delivery, it's a task, but they're, they're on board, and it's because of their hard work that we're making it happen, so very proud of them. Thanks for adding that. Thank you. All right. Well, then the motion was to uh, receive a file and witness that presentation, so Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Cavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. 7-0. Action item number nine is work session request, Central Avenue Corridor Streetscape Master Plan Draft. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move that we set uh, December 19th at uh, 5.30 for the work session. Second by Sprank. Motion by Jones and a second by Sprank. Guessing that works for everybody. A little early Christmas present? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Mr. Jones was here already. So, uh, you know, he's ready for this Can't wait presentation. To do it again. Yes, that's right. All right. So, we have a motion and a second. Adrian, just call the roll, please. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number 10 is request to reschedule July 3rd, 2023 City Council meeting to July 5th, 2023. Mr. Mayor? Ms. Farber. I move that we receive and file and move the meeting date to July 5th, 2023. It's weird to say, isn't it? It is. I'll second. <laughs> All right, got a motion by Farber and a second by Roussel. Uh, just a quick background. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Mr. Can we do that? Um, we set those dates by ordinance. Some time ago, do we need to do an ordinance to change this? Or no, I believe that when we made the most recent adjustments to it, we gave us the flexibility to do that based on holiday okay. schedules, conflicts, and things of that nature. And it happens once every, what, six, seven years? Something Is that like the way that. that works? So, yeah. It's, we do it anyway. Uh, yeah, we looked back to see yeah. how this was done before, and thank you, Adrian, for helping to, to point that out um, and calling that to my attention to, to move it. Um, it is a Wednesday, just to point that out for everybody, but that's, it's because of where the, the 4th of July holiday lands. Mr. Mr. Mayor, yeah, I just want to point out that I won't be able to be there. Okay. Um, I'm conducting that night, so. Okay. All and right. I already made that commitment before yeah. you decided. Be yeah, right. <laughs> now, let's be clear. Okay. <laughs> it wasn't, this is not just of my own free will. No, that's, that's understandable, Mr. Resnick. Thank All right, you. well, thank you. Well, we have a quorum. We need to make sure of that. Um, so far on the calendar, we're good to go. Okay, good. All right, then we have a motion and a second. 
Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Next are council member reports. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Rousseau. Uh, I was honored to be able to attend the National League of Cities in Kansas City last week for three days. And there were over 3,000 representatives from 49 states across the country. And it was just a wonderful opportunity to share resources, uh, networking, and best practices, and uh, to have lunch with people from other communities and just uh, <coughs> discuss what's happening there, and, and I just learned so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roussel. I'll echo that because I was able to attend as well and um, actually present on behalf of the city, so it was nice to, to be there to be able to do that and make those connections. It is a really important thing for how we get things done here, really, to make those connections nationally. Any other reports? Mr. Sprank. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Sprank. Um, these last couple weekends, I've been fortunate enough to volunteer at about three different food giveaways, um, and there is a serious need for food insecurity in our, in our city, folks. Um, one, we gave out 370 boxes. Another one, we gave out 130 boxes. And then there was a turkey giveaway, which um, that was 150 turkeys right across from my house. <laughs> so there's a need, folks. We have to remember that. So thing to talk about it in the future, hopefully. So thank you. Thank you. All right, well, I see we do have a closed session. All right, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Jones. The council going to closed session in accordance with Chapter 21.5 of the Code of Iowa to discuss pending real estate transactions. Second. We have a motion by Jones and a second by Resnick. For the record, the attorney the city council will consult with on the issues to be discussed in closed session is City Attorney Crowner Brumwell. Um, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Which passes 7-0. We are in closed session.